it is massive and there's still a chance that uh, England have the fifth spot in the Champions League it's still possible because Arsenal can still knock out uh, Bayern Munich I'm not sure that West Ham can do it at home even at home against Leverkusen but it's still possible if you know, Villa then go far if they qualify against Lille City as well so it's still possible however right now it looks like Germany uh, uh, have more chances than, 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 than England so that, fourth, that battle for fourth place now becomes even more important between Villa and Spurs and we've said or we will say this, I, I don't think I've ever seen for the remaining seven games in a season or six games a schedule like the one that Spurs are having and yesterday was the first it was the first step in this incredible uh, fixture list that they have and to start this period which is a key period for them and they don't play next week at least they would have a week off a weekend off but to start it with such a such a hammering away at Newcastle was bad but when you think when you think about it and the fact that then they play the North London derby then they would have Chelsea regardless if Chelsea are good or not this season it's still Chelsea away where they've been really good against the top teams then Liverpool away then you've got Burnley okay so maybe a bit of a a bit of a like an easier one on, on paper certainly and then and then it's City at home so it's incredible really Aston Villa even even being at Arsenal today don't have a fixture list as bad as this one as hard as this one that's best. I've never seen a team that's playing back to back against literally the, the, the five biggest teams or six biggest teams in the league yeah, yet yesterday wasn't a good start either they were really off it yesterday Mickey van der Ven had the kind of game that I've not seen him have in a Tottenham mm. shirt, it was it was bizarre watching him. Rachel, we talked about the psychology there a lot of Arsenal and what they might be feeling. I mean, Aston Villa weren't expected to be challenging for the Premier League at this point. That's not being disrespectful to them, but they've been a real surprise and a pleasant one this season. So did they get to this stage and think, well, we're almost playing with house money anyway because we're not supposed to be here? Or is there a fear that reality now bites and they start to think, blame me, we could end up in the Champions League and all kinds of pressure finds its way into that changing room. Yeah, I think probably we've seen how that's impacted Newcastle at spells this year, but, you know, just even... I think it's, it's a, probably a slightly different mentality at the club. Um, when Emery came in, you know, he, he's someone who's got a very clear philosophy, so he obviously came in during it you know, in the, in the middle of something. So there was sort of that period where you get the bounce from him. But in actual fact, that was the beginning of him kind of setting up what he wanted. Um, and I think those good results that came at the beginning of his time at the club really bought the players into the system. And I think that's one of the key things and what he demands from the players as a bigger group. Because if you actually look at the minutes that a lot of players have played, he, he's relied on a lot of players. You know, the whole squad has contributed to the success that's been this season. Um and I think he's very much built on the process and the outcome being the results. And it, it served the team very well. I think there's even been points this season the media have probably lent in a little bit and said Villa are having a wobble um, just when there's been, you know, a bad result or a slightly, you know, almost fatigued performance that there hasn't been many of. But the first sight of that, I think everyone jumps on quite harshly. But... I think they've sort of seen off that. I, th I actually think going into this weekend, the game against Lille was almost the perfect prep. Um, I probably didn't, maybe naively, but I didn't expect Lille to be so dominant in possession. But I think, you know, having that match, especially because it was at home, so you don't you didn't have the travel as well, but they got that experience. They, they suffered in moments. They, they gave opportunities up. Martinez had some great saves. I actually think that puts them in a position this weekend that, you know, I think they'll be prepared to go to Arsenal today and, feel like, yeah, there'll be moments that Arsenal will dominate a lot of the ball and they'll have to be really disciplined defensively, but they'll have an, a plan and an opportunity to then also get at Arsenal and, and have moments in the game where they think we will get our chances here too. Nedim, I thought it was fascinating what Ollie Watkins said after the Brentford match when he said, I'm not belittling my team, I'm part of it. We need to somehow figure out when we're two up how to shut up shop. It's frustrating. We lack that big team mentality where they kill off games, which is really disappointing. Maybe we just don't have that maturity yet or game intelligence. I mean, if that is the case, it makes this task a lot more difficult. I'd suggest they've got to find it between now and the end of the season because they're all big matches the rest of the way. Yeah, they absolutely are. But I think in my perspective, and you know, everyone can say I'm wrong from this, is like they arrive at the Emirates as a significant underdog, whereas for some of these other games, they'll probably be arriving more so as a favourite. 
And I think as an underdog for this match, I think knowing that they've got the likes of Baileys, Diabys, Watkins, you know, Rogers, people who can sort of take the ball in transition, get themselves up the field, that's good. Especially when you know that, you know, there'll be times when you don't have great possession because Arsenal want to dominate the ball. But I think that idea of shutting up shop, that's something that I think we do pine for from the best teams. And I think we, that's why we can be so critical of the likes of, say, Man United and Chelsea and so on. Because like Jules I, and I and everyone else, we talk about control. Like a real team will be good, but then they'll also control the game. Like a 1-0 sometimes might feel like more to the opposition players because they've not touched the ball in five minutes, in 10 minutes. And I think for Villa to be able to do that at the Emirates would be a huge statement because we've seen City not be able to do it there. We've seen Liverpool not be able to do it there and lots of other sides as well. But I think they are like, they're right there. They're in the mix, aren't they? You know, they're, they're yeah. fourth. And there was a spell when, respectfully, we were talking about them in the title race because we were three points off top. But very quickly, that's kind of changed the narrative as such. But now as we look at them for the race for the top four, they're not thinking that Spurs are better than them. They're not thinking that United or Newcastle behind them are better than them. They're, they'll be adamant that they are good enough to be in the Champions League next season. And for them, if that's to be the case, you know, there'll be lots of places like Arsenal where you'll be travelling next season where if you want to be successful, you need to be able to deal with it. So I'm looking forward to seeing how they play, how they approach it, and if they can really sort of do enough to, you know, solidify that fourth spot for now. I mean, I'm, I'm disappointed that Rachel didn't uh, uh, watch me on UK television to know, explain, explain before <laughs> the Aston Villa Lille game how good Lille were, especially how dare you, Rachel? in how possession. Dare you? What, what, what so could sorry. have been more important than that on that night than watching exactly, Jules Flesh. explain things about Arsenal exactly. and Villa? But, Rage. I was, I have to say, I was a bit disappointed by Villa on Thursday night. Uh, I knew Lille would play like that and they were brave and what they did. But for Lille to go to Villa Park on Thursday, for what was Villa's strongest team, right? Yeah. And have more possession, more shots, more shots on target and more expected goals than Villa. I was like, wow, OK. And yeah, of course, Villa won 2-1 and that's the most important. You won and they go to France next week. I don't know what will happen, but they're in a good position to qualify. But I was a bit like, OK, I didn't see... Apart from Oli Watkins, and we can talk about, about him a bit later, who I thought was really impressive. For the rest of the team, I was a bit like, well, I'm not really sure. I've seen them in the first half of the season where they were outstanding every, pretty much everywhere. And like you said, apart from Martinez, who was, who was fantastic with the save that he made, and there was like three 1v1... Um, I thought they were open. I thought defensively they were shaky at times. Diego Carlos, I mean, Rogers loses the ball in the first half at some point. That goes and Jonathan David should have scored for Lille. There was a lot of things like that. And I'm like, I mean, you can't, OK, maybe they're going to get away with it in Europe because they're over two legs and they can still qualify. But in the Premier League, today, if they do that, they're going to get destroyed by Arsenal. If they do that next week, whoever you play in the Premier League, you just you can't do make those mistakes. And there's no Douglas Ruiz today. And I think with the, the camera injury, was, I think, hurt the team really much because he was outstanding in the first half of the season. Now to have Luis out as well for the game today on suspension, I think it's, it's really bad too. And, and they might put out a great performance today. I was just, I'm just saying that on Thursday, I thought I, I just expected more from them. Yeah, I think just on the Luis point, I mean, you're not going to say Villa haven't got Champions League because they've lost at Arsenal today. So if there was a, yeah, game, true, true. If there was a game in the next you know, six for them to be missing him. Maybe today's not the worst one, because I do agree he's he is someone else who's been a massive contributor, especially going forward as vision. Um, he's really stepped up this season, but maybe today's not the worst one for him to miss. Yeah, so that's the 4.30 commentary on Five Live Premier League Sunday. Arsenal, Aston Villa from the Emirates. Chris Wise and Danny Gabadon will bring you that game. The two o'clock game is Liverpool against Crystal Palace. We'll take a look at that shortly. And we've also got West Ham against Fulham on Sports Extra as well today. We're going to head to Augusta National for the first time in a few minutes. Before that, though, let's just check in on the Scottish Premiership match. Rangers had the lead the last time we spoke to Gavin Wallace. Yeah, they do indeed. That goal came on 15 minutes. It was uh, an own goal. Jack Baldwin, own goal on 15. They have Ross County, though. Fletcher, a really good chance. George Harmon, 10 yards out. He just leant far too back, leant way, way too back. The ball skied over the top of the stand. That's their best chance. Rangers, though, have forced a great save from Laidlaw on that right-hand side. It was a really good effort, to be fair. Ball put in, it was a looping header, and he had to tip it over the bar. At the moment, it is still Ross County nil, Rangers 1. And can I just say, 
I'm not having any of these uh, Pepe Reina and Stone Cold Steve Austin today. Absolutely <laughs> not. I was considering just going home. I am not having that. And I'm here in the stone cold weather. Not happening. Not happening. <laughs> Gavin, wait till you hear the last one. That's all I'm going to say to you, oh, my no. friend. Wait till you hear the last one, because we've only got four out of five. Uh, Gavin Wallace watching Ross County against Rangers. Rangers four points behind Celtic in the table, but this is one of their two games in hand, so a big goal at the moment, uh, giving Rangers the lead. Let's head to the uh, Tottenham Hotspur Stadium. Tottenham against Leicester in the Women's FA Cup semi-final. Any more goals, Flo Pollock? No, still Tottenham nil, Leicester one. Spurs making the most of the space on this massive pitch in the wide areas, but their delivery into the box has been poor. Leicester looking more threatening when they attack. Deanne Rose and goal scorer Yuta Rantel are causing havoc in the Spurs defence. Four minutes to go to half-time, Tottenham nil, Leicester one. Thank you, Flo. So back to the football shortly, but we're into the final day of the Masters and world number one Scotty Scheffler leads in Augusta. Let's head there now and hear from Catherine Downs. Yes, thanks, Darren. BBC Golf correspondent Ian Carter and LPGA winner Trish Johnson alongside me after what was an exceptional day of golf yesterday. Looking forward to today's final day. Let's just reflect on Saturday. Trish, the wind on Friday, the sunshine yesterday, it made for really, really tough conditions out there yesterday. Yeah, it really did. Um, I think that's one of the best days golf I have ever seen at the Masters. Uh, I, I was just... Uh, I couldn't take my eyes off it. Um, I don't think I've ever seen a day where so many good shots were played and so many unbelievably awful shots were played all in the space of about half an hour. Um, you know, you watched uh, Nikolai uh, get to the 11th hole, have a look at the scoreboard, he's leading, and then just capitulate five bogeys on the trot. You saw Scotty Scheffler, you think, he's out of it. He's gone back from six to four but the superstar he is, obviously, he made a comeback. But there were just so many stories. DeChambeau, uh, an amazing finish at 18 yesterday. And his mood just changed around beyond belief. It was just the best day's golf I have seen in an awful long time. It set up a brilliant final day today. Much of the day yesterday, four players with a share of the lead. Only two rounds in the 60s, touching on those really difficult conditions. Colin Morikawa, one of those. He's already a two-time major winner. He's not been playing his best golf, but he was impressive yesterday, Ian. Yes, he's done nothing all season long, really, and has not been a factor in the majors in recent times either. And this was someone who very quickly in his career won two majors, the second of which was the Open at Royal St George's, you'll remember. And it was like going back to those times with what I thought was a really classy round of 69 yesterday, opened up with three straight birdies. But then, as you've been describing, things got more and more difficult as the day went on. The greens just got faster and faster. The number of times you saw a putt that looked very good catch the edge, edge of the hole and then accelerate off the lip and then leave these really treacherous three, four, five-foot putts coming back. So to be able to hold it together and shoot in the 60s in those circumstances, I thought was very, very impressive. Another of the players who was playing in the final group yesterday, Max Homer, also in a share of the lead for big stretches of yesterday. Steady golf from Homer. He's not out of it at five under par. Do you think he's got what it takes, Trish, to land his first major championship today? Yeah, I really do. And yesterday's round from him was extraordinary in the fact that he only shot one over. He didn't make any birdies whatsoever. Had a look at... He had a lot of chances, no two ways about it. He left himself really difficult putts. But, but what I like about him is he, he just... The fact that he's played on Saturday and had his poor round, if you like, and he's only two shots behind, that, to me, gives him a massive chance because he's got to be thinking he's going to make some putts and some birdies tomorrow. I was going to make that point because you made it in our commentary last night, Trish, that when you walk off after a round like that the feeling internally is, I'm due a few tomorrow. Without a shadow of a doubt. You know, so, with so many times you see a player shoot, I don't know, 64, 65 on Saturday, and I always think to myself, unless they are, unless it's Scotty Scheffler, that's tough to back up because invariably you've hold an absolute bucket load of putts. He hasn't held a putt for about five hours. So he's got to be thinking tomorrow, you know, that is... Uh, 
that's every chance that he could possibly win his first major championship. And how do you feel if you're a player like Bryson DeChambeau walking off last night after double bogeying the 15th, bogey on 16, and then holing for a birdie on the last from about 90 yards out of the green? What, what a way to finish yesterday. Yeah, and the last group, I mean, you know, Ian was describing it yesterday, and to hold that shot, I mean, his, his demeanour just obviously changed in the split second because he was he was crestfallen let's be honest he had totally played himself out the duff chip an extraordinary decision actually Ian we were talking about it at 15 his second shot he was in no position to go for that he was blocked out by the trees down the left hand side and the percentage play was just knock it out give yourself a comfortable yardage in and take your medicine maybe you'll make a four but you shouldn't make anything worse than a five but he kind of went for it and I half wondered whether he got that in his mind that there was a kind of bailout place down the right there. There was grandstands, there were trees there. But he did leave himself a really, really difficult third shot. He duffed it, it went into the water, and ultimately he walks off with a double bogey. Yeah, and to be fair, he got lucky because he got a drop away from the tree. Or he got... No, he, no it wasn't... Well, it was. The tree was in the way, but he got a drop away from a, um, a TV tower, a small little TV tower, because that tree would have been in his way. So he had the perfect shot in. But unfortunately, he played it very amateurishly, to say the least. Made double, and then, of course, he went on to three putts 16 as well. So he was in a terrible... And he was in trouble on 18 as well. He's very much looking like he's going to finish on one under, and there's no way on earth that you can give Scotty Scheffler a six-shot lead. But all of a sudden, it's changed everything. Three under par, though, Bryson DeChambeau, so a good four shots off the lead. Scotty Scheffler going into today's final day with a one-shot lead. Already has a green jacket. He's proven he can get it done. He's dominant in every area of the game. Give it to Scotty already, Ian. No, it's not all over by any stretch of the imagination. We saw how things can fluctuate so quickly on this Augusta National course. It will be set up for low scoring on the back nine. If that is possible with the greens as quick as they are, they will be as sympathetic as they can be. That means that players can make a charge. They can exert pressure. But what I would say is that he came into this as a very short odds favourite. Those odds have shortened further. And the way that he made his birdie on the last, late last night, that was the hallmark of someone who is on course to win a second major, to fully justify being the world number one, to fully justify being a short odds favourite. So he is the man to beat by, by a mile. Um, but there are no guarantees on this golf course. I think it's going to be absolutely absorbing tonight. Ian, Trish, thank you very much. Find out which way the green jacket goes. We are on from 8 o'clock tonight on 5 Live and on BBC Sounds. And you can follow live text coverage on the BBC Sport website and app. Fantastic. Looking forward to that. 8 o'clock tonight. Mark Chapman leading the team. Thanks to Kat, thanks to Ian and to Trish as well. Uh, live coverage on 5 Live, the final round of the US Masters from 8 o'clock tonight. So we've reached half time in the two 12 o'clock kickoffs that we're covering. First to the Scottish Premiership, Ross County Rangers, Gavin Wallace. Advantage Rangers flight, Ross County nil, Rangers won. That goal coming on 15 minutes. It was a Jack Baldwin own goal. John Sutter was the man that tried to claim it. It was a Tavernier corner. Silva flicked it on with his head, and the two of them kind of collided at the back post, and Baldwin got the final touch. There's been chances for both teams. Butlins made a great save. Josh Sims evaded the Rangers the defence, cut inside, and it was a smart save down to the goalkeeper's right hand side, Cyril Dessers had missed a guilt edge chance, he just leant too far back just before half time Rangers though I feel Fletch only really in second gear just now, so a little bit more expected from them in the second half but it's results that matter and just now they have the advantage Ross County nil, Rangers won So advantage Rangers at half time and advantage Leicester City women too in the women's FA Cup semi-final, Flo Pollock that's right, Leicester lead at the break. Tottenham nil, Leicester won. A goal fitting of a semi-final from Leicester's Yuta Rantala. She picked it up on the right, chopped inside and hit a rocket. Her 10th goal this season. And it's the difference so far in this FA Cup semi-final. Tottenham with lots of work to do. In the second half, they've barely tested Leicester's goalkeeper. Half-time, Tottenham nil, Leicester won. And the second semi-final, by the way, kicks off at 2.35. Manchester United against Chelsea. And Ellen White's going to join us later to preview that one. It's the second weekend of Cricket's County Championship. Kevin Howells is at the Oval for Surrey's match against Somerset. Third day, uh, nearing lunch, of course. The story, Jerry, lots of runs being scored. 
around the country. Lots of talk about the Cookerborough ball. I won't trouble you too much on that, Darren, right now, but there's plenty of talk about it. Here are the Oval defending champions, Surrey, extending their first innings lead over Somerset. Uh, 428 all out. That's in front by 143. That appears to be a really big and significant lead here. There was a very entertaining battle between the twin brothers, Jamie and Craig Overton. I'm not too sure who came out on top, possibly Jamie. The England spinner, though, Shoei Bashir, beautiful control, just the one wicket to show from his 36 overs. Uh, the games elsewhere in Division 2, Yorkshire taking serious control in Bristol, second innings versus Gloucestershire. Uh, they're currently 131 for the loss of no wicket in that second innings. It's a lead of 234 runs, another century in just his second game of the season for Adam Lyth. Thank you, Kevin. So let's wrap up the anagrams, shall we, uh, and put this to bed. Um, Colin Murray <laughs> set us five at the start of the show. We've got four. William Enfield's been a superstar. Uh, the theme of this week, weather-related sports people. So Stone Cold Steve Austin <laughs> was tenuous. The one that none of us got, but Stephen Altrincham did. <laughs> Mystery animator. Any ideas? Hold on. Did you say Stephen Altrincham? I feel like I know a Stephen Altrincham. Yeah, me too. Yeah, I know one. He uh, he's taking a day <laughs> off today. Because he worked yesterday and he can't work two days in a row. Yeah, world. can't. No, can't work twice. No, let's not do back to back. We know who's do, do, Jules. Who are we talking about here? He's got a dog, hasn't he? Yeah. Oh, he does have a dog. Yeah, yeah. he's got a really nasty pair of Air Force <laughs> Ones as well, covered in muck. Is that Steve Crossman and Altrincham? Is that who you sent it in? Fletch, have you been done? I have no idea whether it's Steve Crossman <laughs> or not. I don't know. I'm just, I'm just waiting for you to finish until I, so I can give you the answer. That's all I'm waiting for. On, I'm just waiting us. for your cue. I hope it is Steve Crossman because then he can give you a bit of stick when he's back in the chair next week. Oh god! Based on the fact that you had the big build-up, Nadeem, and you've got zero. It's because it was a naff week, zero. you know what I mean? It's a bad zero. week. It's a bad zero. week for conundrums. I'll be back. Don't zero. worry about it. This is relegation form for uh, enough. This, this, this is nothing. This is nothing. So, I can't take part in so, this. <laughs> So, mystery animator, a three-time Olympic gold medalist, American beach volleyball player, Misty May Trina. Wow. Yeah. That's, That's tough. tough. That's yeah, tough. exactly. Yeah. You know when you said, is she a big name? If you like your American beach volleyball, I'm sure she's a gigantic <laughs> name. I don't follow that sport, so I've never heard of her. But... And she's probably never heard of me either, so this is not a one-way thing. Of course. That's what it yeah, is. So we now have all five. In fact, I'm more confident she's never heard of me than she is that I've never heard of her. <laughs> Let's just get that straight. So, <laughs> mystery animator, Misty May Trina, and you'll have to wait till next week to find out whether it's Steve Crossman or not who's got the final answer. If it is, well done, Steve. Brilliant. Um, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, two goals from Bruno Fernandes rescued a point for Manchester United at Bournemouth in the tea time kickoff on Saturday. Eric Ten Hag is still seeing the positives. Uh, the good thing is we twice we fought back from a losing position, um, which is good. You see the team spirit is good, uh, but I think yeah, by the end we could have been a little bit more composed and, and calm, and then we could have played more chances out. Because also I think the opponent was struggling because they gave so much in the first half, so much energy, and there were uh, so much gaps had to take benefit from it. Bruno Fernandes was outstanding for you again today, um, as he has been really throughout certainly the last month or so. But he's having a very good season. He's he's so crucial to you in these games. Uh, scoring twice, uh, very creative. Uh, it's true. It gives a lot of energy to the team. So uh, he's acting as a captain, so he brings the energy in the team, and yeah, we are very pleased with this. Uh, you mentioned the, the captain. I, thought, I think he's becoming a really good captain, isn't he? He demands high standards, higher standards from those around him. And I think he was very disappointed at the end of the game that you couldn't, even after the free kick, create an opportunity to win the match in the minute that remained. Yeah, it's true. And we're all disappointed, but yeah, he expressed that feeling. Uh, we we have to win our games, and we dropped uh, in the last four games. We dropped too many points and unnecessary. So that's Eric Ten Hag, the Manchester United manager, talking to match of the day Steve Wilson. It was Steve Crossman, by the way, just to put you <laughs> out your misery. Then. It was Steve Crossman who got mystery <laughs> animator. Oh, it was Steve. Oh, um, Jules, he's one of the guys. I think you know when you sit in the house and it, it's pouring down with rain outside. 
and there's nothing on the telly and you feel a bit fed up. I think I'd like Ten Hag to come and sit on the settee with me because he'd make me feel better. Because regardless <laughs> of what Manchester United yeah. roll out, he sees a million positives. He'd brighten up any dismal day. Um, is he a little bit blinded, though, to the fact that Manchester United right now are, apart from one or two flurries in games against Liverpool, giving us very little in terms of optimism looking forward? I mean, definitely. And I don't want to go on every week. <laughs> no, I'd do still, it, Jules. Do it, Jules. Do it, do it, do it. Do it. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. He, he can stay as positive as he wants watching the game and looking at the stats. And really, you know this is not all true. And every time, I think he sees those opportunities, and we've said it before, as like he wants to convince himself to start with that maybe it's not as bad. Maybe the fans as well who are listening to our, our interview or, or match of the day or, you know, press conferences, everything. He wants to convince his boss now, or the new bosses, certainly, Sir Jim Ratcliffe, Sir Dev Brailsford, Jean-Claude Blanc, Dan Ashworth, Omar Berada, all those people that, hey, you know, it's all good, it's all positive, it's... it's I mean, he almost said he almost said after the game yesterday, yeah, it's great. We drew two two away at Bournemouth, but we, but it's great. No, it's not great. It's not great again. You had eight shot. They had twenty. They had, you got lucky at the end that that penalty was okay. Maybe it was the right call in the end, but just about, just about. It was not great. It was not a good performance again from United. And yes, you've got injuries, but everybody has injuries. We talked about Villa before. No Douglas Luiz, no Camara today. We can talk about. Pretty much every team in the Premier League, they've had injuries. And yeah, United have had a lot of injuries, but so have Liverpool, for example. They've been woeful yesterday again, United. And for him to come out and say, oh, this is great, this, 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 that, it's still positive, you know, we keep... No, we know you're not. It's not, it's not true. It's not true, I'm sorry. You watched them yesterday, that first... I mean, for me, the clever goal, the first one, Solanke, young Camboala, we talked about him before, one of my boys, made a mistake, OK, it can happen. And structurally, there was, it was just an individual mistake from a centre back against a, a, a really good informed number nine like Solanke. Okay, that can happen. The second goal, structurally, from a United point of view, defensively, everywhere on the pitch, is so bad to concede. If you if you look at Senesi, nobody nobody is pressing him. He can run with the ball like 20 yards, then pass the ball to Clever. No pressure, nothing, far too easy, so much space, everything. It's just a terrible goal to concede from a team that was all over the place in that game. And yeah, of course, they drew. So they, they at least came back twice. They got a point away at Bournemouth. But it's not good enough, I'm sorry. No. And Ten Hag can say anything he wants. It's not the truth. It's not. I mean, Jamie Redknapp said... Um, on the television last night that Casemiro looked like he was playing in soccer aid I mean based on <laughs> how he was gliding around the pitch and I mean I, I, I saw him against Chelsea in, 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 in the match that Chelsea came back and won at the end and I mean I, the lack of ability to get around the pitch now for Casemiro Rachel is, is, is startling really I mean there are so many holes I mean they are a team that can score but as Jules just said structurally and individually there are so many holes and mistakes that get made game after game that they're so easy to score against. Yeah, it's it's just strange watching them, I think. I think, you know, you can speak about Casemiro. I think the, he, for me, isn't maybe the one that normally does stand out with that, though. I think we've spoken about this probably too many times this season. The amount of times there's clips of players who just don't seem to be able to put in the consistent effort and intensity when you would expect to see it. You know, there's... Of course, you understand the demands of the game are tough at times, but you're talking about players, you know, I think it was Rashford against Chelsea. There's clips of him being on the pitch for less than five minutes, just sort of ambling towards the ball when you don't have possession. And these are the things that I think are really difficult for fans and people watching to get on board when Ten Hag comes out and says there's positives, the culture's good, things are, you know, rosier than they've been. Because those are the things that you sort of clutch onto as fans. When things don't go your way, you go, yeah, but... I'm seeing the attitude, I'm seeing the application. Y you don't see it. And even, you know, Jules talking about the second goal is Bournemouth, who I've actually been very impressed with this year in a lot of games. I enjoy watching them. They've got a good style. It's, it's good football they play. They literally walk the ball forward and pass straight through the team. That that literally wouldn't be accepted at any level. So for it to be accepted sort of week after week in the Premier League just seems absolutely staggering. Nathan, there are positives. They're called Alejandro Garnacho and Kobe Mainu. Are there any more? Um, well, Garnacho, he only got a half yesterday, didn't he? That's that's. that's why, not... why just a half, by the way? 
uh, go on, yeah. you're going to tell me why, Jules? I don't know, maybe he was injured, I don't know, but yeah. the lack of effort, especially defensively, when United didn't have the ball from Garnacho yesterday, I thought was just baffling. Mm. And he, as good he, as it he, can be. Jules, we, is he falling into that category of what we used to see at Paris Saint-Germain? If Neymar's not doing it, I'm not going to do it. Is he looking around now and picking up bad habits? Because that can be dangerous. He's a talent. Yeah. And if he's looking at one or two others, shirking the out-of-possession stuff, that's not for a, that's not good for a young player to see. And Mbappe fell victim of that for a while at PSG, didn't he? Yeah, when everybody but... would just turn around and watch the rest of the team not win the ball back. If, if that's starting to happen with him, a player that might be a, a foundational piece for mm. them moving forward, that's a real worry. Yeah, thank me for reminding me of all the uh, the issues with my uh, PSG team. But but you're right. <laughs> Apologies. It's okay, my friend. <laughs> There's a, Kirkus is a really good left back. He's a, got, he's a yeah. young left back that I think can even go higher than, than, than Bournemouth. There's an instant in the first half where he does a simple one two with, I think, maybe Ryan Christie. And he continues, so he does the one, continues his run for the two inside the box. Christie puts the ball over. And then Kirkus, I think, is a bit unlucky. His first touch maybe is not as perfect. And then I think there's a shot that maybe. Onana saves or something, right? So, that, so he's the player that Ganacho is is marking, right? Ganacho is the right winger. This is his left back. So there's the one you have to follow for the two, okay? So he doesn't do it the first time. If you if you're Ten Hag, and by the way, this is on on I think this is on Ten Hag's side, by the way. So where his bench is, this is his side. You you shout at Ganacho saying, listen, this is the first and last time in this game where you don't follow your marker. Five minutes later. Again, Kirk is on the ball, plays the one-two with one of the Bournemouth players. The ball goes over the top. What's Garnacho doing? After the one, he stopped running already. And Kirk goes through again, the one-two goes through. And then again, Bournemouth have been lucky and United are very lucky that it doesn't come out of anything. But, if okay. but, but the point as well is not so much Ten Hag telling Garnacho or Garnacho knowing by himself that this is not acceptable at this level. It's also if there was a leader for United on the pitch, so a Maguire, a Casemiro, or Nana, Bruno, I don't care who, they should have gone to see Garnacho and said, listen, this is not good enough from you. Because like Rachel just said, this is the problem of this team. There's no accountability for anybody. There's no leadership on that pitch. There hasn't been a leader for the whole season, really. Yeah, so when Garnacho gets away, doesn't defend. Nobody says anything. So he gets away with it. Same with Rashford the other day. All the time it's like that. <laughs> It's my fault for mentioning Paris Saint-Germain. It's probably going well. <laughs> You're going to be more passionate, Eva. <laughs> Nedan, very briefly, because I've got, to, I've got to go to Anfield for Sorry. the first time today. The, the, the answer to all of that is that when they brought Ten Hag in at the outset, he was supposed to be a culture setter. And here we are, all these issues being highlighted perfectly by Jules and by Rachel... And that's exactly what the current manager was brought in to get away from. Yeah, I, I don't know if I can answer that one quickly, to be honest. But um, <laughs> yeah, last season, he did seem like they were heading in that sort of direction. I think the fact that, you know, he was strong enough to say, send away Ronaldo, who he didn't believe was part of their plans and other players, that felt great. But then this year, it just, it's, just not, it's just not been the one, has it? And I'm not as passionate as say Jules is, because overall, I do see Ganacho defending, I see other people defending. But yeah, not as yesterday. You... That's why he was off at half time. <laughs> yeah, it's because but... I mentioned Paris Saint-Germain. He would have been a lot more serene and mm. not <laughs> dragged up those awful memories it's of true, Champions it's true. League too failures soon. Too gone soon by. Flesh, too soon, flesh. Too soon. I gone by. Uh, Gavin Wallace has seen another goal in the Scottish Premiership. We have indeed. We've not long started the second half. Let's. Simon Murray has equaled things up for the host. It took two or three attempts. It fell out to the forward, just on the right hand side in front of the main stand here, and he lashed it home for his eleventh. Seventh goal of the season. This could be a big dent in Rangers title hopes. Ross County won. Rangers won. A massive second half to come. Rangers starting that match four behind Celtic, two games in hand. So any kind of advantage they want to glean, they're going to have to try and find a winning goal in the second half. So just past one o'clock, let's head to Anfield for the first time today. Liverpool against Crystal Palace kicks off at two. Full commentary coming up here on Five Live. Ian Dennis, one part of our commentary team. And Deno, you've got the team news. Do indeed, Darren. Yes, Liverpool have made five changes and one of them means that Alisson is back in goal. It's a return after missing the last 14 games with a thigh injury. He replaces Kelleher. Diaz comes in for Gakpo, Salah for Elliott, Robertson instead of Simakas at left-back and Bradley for Gomez at right-back. So five changes from the team that was humbled by Atalanta here on Thursday night in the Europa League. So Alisson in goal, a back four of Bradley, Van Dijk, Canate and Robertson, the midfield three of McAllister, Endo and Jones, and then Salah, Nunez 
and Luis Diaz. As for Crystal Palace, from the team that played Manchester City, they make two changes. Klein is one of them in defence for Ward. Elise comes back in after injury and he replaces Ayu. So Henderson in goal, a back three of Nathaniel Klein, Joachim Anderson and Jefferson Lerma. Munoz and Mitchell are the wing-backs, right and left, respectively. Hughes and Wharton in the centre of midfield, two talented players in Elise and Eze behind Mateta. Ian, thank you. The other Premier League game at two is West Ham Fulham. You can listen to that on Five Sports Extra. Let's get the team news from the London Stadium from Sahel Sahi. Yeah, David Moyes makes three changes to his Europa League 11 with Danny Ings starting up front alongside Mikel Antonio, Naif Agard and Edson Alvarez. They're the other two to come into the 11. Zuma, Cresswell and Suchet, they're all on the bench. Only one change for Fulham who are without a win in their last three games. Sasa Lukic replaces Tom Kearney. OK, thank you, Sahel. Gavin Wallace, another goal. Which way? It's went for the home side this time, Flex. Oh. Ross County 2, Rangers 1. Wowee. <laughs> uh, George Harmon was first on the scene after uh, Jack Butland pammed away a Simon Murray shot. He's just scored a minute, literally a minute to 90 seconds ago. And all Harmon had to do was just slot it into the net. And, uh, well, how does this do for the championship in Scotland? Ross County 2, Rangers 1. Blimey, Brendan Rodgers has just helped himself to a second Yorkshire pudding and Neil Lennon's <laughs> probably dancing a jig of joy at Anfield, Lenny. What about that for a second goal for Ross County then? Uh, hold on, I'm still in shock here. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, listen, it, it is a title race. It's the first one we've had, Fletch, for a while and uh, it's very exciting. But, um, look, we've already seen what can happen in runnings before, so... It's going to flip-flop again, I'd imagine, between now and the end of the season. I would imagine Rangers to come back strong in the latter half of this game, but it wouldn't surprise me if they drop points today. No conspiracy theories allowed on Five Live Premier League Sunday with regard to the, the Scottish title race as it stands. What about this one in England, though? Three fighting for it. Fascinating. Um, Manchester City top on 73. Arsenal 71, Liverpool 71. Arsenal best goal difference, Liverpool worst. Um, this is as tight as it's been for a long, long time in the top division of English football. How are you seeing it? Well, I mean, it's very... I watched City yesterday, I thought they were pretty dominant and um, they've got a decent run in as well. I, I've got a, I don't know, my, my heart's saying Liverpool and um, I know they dropped points last week, but that didn't surprise me at Manchester United. They can always sort of raise the game. Arsenal have been outstanding defensively, um, but I just have a feel for, for Liverpool, and that's just coming from my heart and not my head. If it was my head, I would say Man City because of the, the easy running. The thing is for City and Arsenal, Fletch is the Champions League. If they stay in it, you know, if they go through, they're going to play each other in the semi final, and you know, the intensity of those games can take a lot earlier for the following games two or three days later. So it's going to be a fascinating watch. City have got their feet up already this weekend you know they've done their business and they've got a big game against Madrid you know Arsenal have got a, a tricky one against Villa who are a little bit up and down at the minute but I expect Arsenal to win that and I expect Liverpool to bounce back really strongly today you know we didn't see the result coming on Thursday or the performance really so you know they've just got to use that hurt as a motivation for today I think it's fascinating you talk about the possibility of a, of a Manchester City Arsenal semi-final in the Champions League and the intensity that that would bring I can't get away from trying to work out in my head what the Liverpool players are thinking right now, knowing that Jurgen Klopp's going to be leaving at the end of the season. They want to win him as much as they can and for themselves before he goes. I just wonder how much pressure, additional pressure, that's putting on the group. Yeah, possibly. I mean, I always think it's, um, you know, it's, it, it can work against you when you make an announcement that early. Um, but these are experienced players and an experienced manager. You know, there's going to be a lot of emotion surrounding the the manager and the players over the next sort of month or so but the you know they've got the professional they know what's at stake well it'll be interesting to see after today what his approach is going to be for thursday night as well does he go strong and and try and you know reclaim the tie back or does he just rest players and just go week to week between now and the end of the season they've already bagged the league cup they're out of the fa cup the premier league is now the holy grail for them and um, that would be the priority for me put it that way but you know, there's going to be so much mental sort of you know exhaustion involved in all of this as well with the extra sort of sidetrack of him you know leaving at the end of the season Dano just on that Liverpool team 
that you gave us. I mean, when you read out the 11 today, that would tell you exactly where Jurgen Klopp's priorities lie. I mean, that's much more like the Liverpool team you'd expect to see compared to the one we saw on Thursday. Yeah, I think there was uh, some were surprised that he made the changes that he did against Atalanta. Six changes on Thursday. I also think was a, a contributing factor was the uh, the protest that the supporters did at Anfield. There was no flags, and that culminated in uh, a very unlike European atmosphere at Anfield because at times it can be quite daunting for, uh, for the opposition, but the atmosphere was as flat as I can remember for a long time at Anfield. And they were fortunate that Atalanta actually didn't win by a greater margin the, the chances that they had. So there will be a reaction. But, uh, but Salah, Nunez and, and Diaz in the, as, a, as a front three. McAllister, Endo's got a good record. When he started, Liverpool are unbeaten in the Premier League with him in the midfield. And all of a sudden now you've got probably with, with Bradley, Van Dijk, Canate and Robertson. I mean, Bradley's done exceptionally well uh, since he's come in with Alexander-Arnold, who incidentally is on the bench, but it just feels a little bit more like a, a settled defence too. And Alisson as well, back in goal, has got to be a huge boost because Kelleher was clearly at fault for, uh, for at least one of the goals on Thursday night. Absolutely, and Dennis and Neil Lennon, your commentary team at Anfield for Liverpool against Crystal Palace. Michael Elise uh, starting for Palace today. That's the first time that Oliver Glasner has been able to include him from the start. So two of the big three, as far as Palace are concerned, playing today, Eze, Elise, and they'll look to get Decore back at the start of next season too. I've been spoken to um, Oliver Glasner last week before the game against Manchester City. Uh, those are the three players that he's pinning his hopes on to try and build uh, Crystal Palace into a better Premier League force. Uh, so Julian Laurence, Neda Manua, Rachel Corsi with me on Five Live Premier League Sunday. Liverpool coming off the back of Thursday's 3-0 home defeat against Atalanta in the Europa League quarter-final first uh, leg. Jurgen Klopp expects a reaction. I don't think it's a general low point, even when we kind of see it like that as well, but performance-wise, a low, a low point, yeah. So um, the good thing about really bad performances is to, do, to play better. Uh, so we should start from there. Yes, we have to show reaction, definitely, 100%. That's clear. Even I have to think from time to time, and I will think about that. It's now not the first time in my life that I lost a football game, unfortunately. And um, yes, we will show a reaction, I can promise. So he's promising a reaction, Nadim. You'd be surprised if there wasn't one, wouldn't you? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I think that game on Thursday almost feels like it didn't happen. Like, did, did Liverpool really lose 3-0 at home? To a side, you know, as Jules would probably tell us, Atalanta, Atalanta are a good side. Yeah. But there have been far better sides that have gone to Anfield and lost to Liverpool. So you're not expecting that whatsoever. And I think, as Ian said, maybe the changes did have, a, have an impact and the situation with the flags had an impact. But still, that's just... It's such a strange day. And I think for these sides that are really good, I'd always back them after a defeat because of the fact that it's not just, say, the manager's idea to win the next game. Like, those players are winners. They're not going to be approaching a game in a sort of a manner where it's like, well, you know, hopefully we'll be all right. They'll be determined to do well and getting a chance to do it again in front of those fans. It's almost like saying, well, this is to make amends to what came before because that's not who we are and this is who we are. And I, I'll be honest, I worry for Palace today. <laughs> yeah. Rachel, we gave some numbers out on Friday. Um, it's taken 13.1 shots per goal, I think, over Liverpool's last 10 games. They're having a, an inordinate, inordinate amount of shots, but they're not converting them into goals. They're struggling to keep clean sheets as well. I mean, this is not just kind of one, a one-off on Thursday night. There are issues within the team in terms of how it's performing right now at a time when Jurgen Klopp needs them to be at their best. They went to Old Trafford and should have won the FA Cup match. They should have won the Premier League game. They didn't convert the opportunities that they generated. Is that something that they can turn around quickly? Is that something you'd expect them to put right today? Or is that likely to really cost them in a situation they're in now where any drop points at this stage is probably going to be fatal? There's certainly not much room for error in terms of dropping points. I, I would definitely say that. In terms of sort of the, the chances, though, I think as a manager, you'd be happy you're creating them and you probably are hoping in some ways that you know you've you've had that run of you you needed a lot to convert and you, you sort of hope then maybe you'll get a, a little flurry in your favour. I, th I think probably Jurgen Klopp will be trying to not make it as, as sort of emotionally heavy either way. I, I think he's someone who's a bit more pragmatic and there's a lot more sort of again process and structure. You look at that starting eleven and you would absolutely back them to to score goals today. I think especially against. Palace at home, not to just 
say that the game's done and dusted, but I really can't see Liverpool not coming away with a win today. And you're looking, you're going back, I think, to 2017 before Palace have got a good result against Liverpool in the league. And this season, I think they've they've managed three wins away from home. So I, I don't imagine going to somewhere like Anfield is, is where they'll maybe get another one. Fletch, I'm going to get ahead of this just quickly, just a really, really quick point. The way you described Liverpool in this moment, 13 shots per goal and struggling to keep clean sheets, felt like yeah. an attack against me in the second half of my career, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> Those were literally... I was like, you never I was like, had oh, that of shots. <laughs> Listen, no, but that's the problem, Jules. It would take me a whole season to have 13, so I may end up with one goal. <laughs> right. See, that's yeah. the point. I love that, Fletch. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for making me feel Fantastic. so welcome and comfortable. Fantastic. Um, <laughs> Lenny, as a manager, you know when you've got a team like Liverpool that are generating all of these opportunities but it's taken an age to stick one in. In reality how are you feeling? What's Jurgen Klopp saying to the players in the week? Because the performances aren't that far away from being exactly what he wants but there's something right now in terms of whether it's being clinical, ruthless, whether it's a mindset whatever it is that's just holding them back a little bit. Yeah, I, I, listen as long as it's creating the chances Fletch, you got to be happy you know, and um, you, you just got to trust the players to take them. Maybe be a little bit of tension in the in the in the dressing room before the game or during the game, whatever. But um, listen, I love watching Liverpool play. I, I still think the way he sets his team out and that power of football to play and that they come at you from all different angles and you know both sides of the pitch and through the middle and the speed on the counter attack. I just love watching them play, and that's why you know my heart's saying that they'll win it. Um, in truth, like you know, you watch the City yesterday and they're just so powerful, so much methodical with the way they go about their business and just wear you down in the end. I mean, they just took looting apart, you know, any way they wanted to. But from a manager's point of view, all you can do is keep making sure they're putting themselves in the right positions and keep getting the ball into those positions as well. Jules, you know, when you look at it, I mean, Neil's just said there, his head's telling him, his heart's telling him Liverpool, his head, if he sat down and thought about it, would probably go Manchester City. I, I, when I look at it, I, they're kind of third out of three for me right now. I know it can change because we watch each of them play and then we kind of say, oh, yeah, I, I now think that they're going to win it based on the performance that we see. It's that kind of title race. How much confidence have you got in Liverpool to finish up with Arsenal and Manchester City as it stands the way they're playing right now? I think they have. For me, it's, it's all on the same level, really. So they all have 33% to make it. It's so tight. Really? Yeah, because, and... Yeah, we can look, I think Rachel said earlier, Liverpool on paper, the fixture list looks maybe slightly more favourable than City and, and Arsenal, but also, Fletch, you said, Arsenal have less away games remaining than the other two. So, for me, it's the same. What I would say, there's something very interesting that Klopp said after the United game, with all the chances that they had and the expected goals was over three. He said, in those chances, I wish the boys had taken an extra touch before going for the shot. And... If you start rushing those chances, if you're Darwin or Luis Diaz or Mo Salah or McAllister, somebody like that, all the amazing players, great talent, it would have been surprising, from a, I think, from a club point of view, to see them in that position where you see them at training every day. You do all those attacking drills, all those finishing drills, where you, you trust them to do the right thing in that position. So if you need to take an extra touch, you do it. If you don't, if you have to hit it first time, you do it. All of that. And clearly he felt that against United, that game management from the players themselves in front of goals, in front of Onana or the defence, was off. And that was slightly worrying me. You can work on it at training, but then under that pressure of an Old Trafford crowd, away from home, in a game where you know that if you miss that chance, potentially you, the title will be gone at the end of the season, I think this is, and we go back to emotions again that we were talking about for Arsenal. It's the same. I agree with Nadem. I think I would not want to be Glasner or Crystal Palace today because they, they're going to get battered. But I think it would be very interesting, let's say, at Everton, which is maybe of the remaining game with the Villa away games, they're the two toughest one, I think, from a, from a Liverpool point of view. If you go to Goodison Park, in that atmosphere, and those, especially the, your attacking players, don't make the right decision, you could be in trouble. Yeah. Um, no clean sheets in their past eight at Anfield, but they are unbeaten in 28 home league games, winning 22 and drawing six. Uh, Jules has just mentioned the dreaded expected goals statistic, which I hate. But, I mean, Liverpool could be the death of it because <laughs> whenever you see a full time at the minute and see Liverpool's expected goals, it bears no resemblance to how many they've actually scored. Um, answer me this, Nadim, and you might say, well, how would I know that? But let's say they all get through in Europe this week. 
is it advantageous to play Wednesday, Saturday in the Champions League or is it a problem to play Thursday, Sunday? Because everybody seems to moan about that one but then be OK playing on a Wednesday and then at the weekend. Thursdays seem to get in everybody's head at this stage of the season. I'll be honest, I used to dream of playing Tuesdays and Wednesdays but I did play Thursdays in the UEFA <laughs> Cup so I can't necessarily talk about the early days. But I think at this stage when it's this two-legged affair, it's, in my opinion, it's not necessarily whether it's Thursday, Sunday, Wednesday, Saturday. It's where is that game in the midweek? I think, for example, Liverpool this week, there'll be a few eyes that will be looking at them playing against Fulham away on the Sat on the Sunday because yeah. they're playing away in Atalanta on the Thursday. So they're having to do probably more travel than other teams would potentially have to do. And I think the fact that, you know, this is why we probably believe they'll be Palace today is because they were at home, they were home on Thursday and they're home on Sunday. For them, that's just two games in the space of a few days. So I wouldn't necessarily say it's the nature of the day. It's the location. It's like, when are you, where are you getting to that game? And for these guys, like, for us, we're very privileged because when, say, when Liverpool finish playing against Atalanta on Thursday, we'll probably just turn the TV off and go to bed. For them, they're still in Atalanta and they're not already preparing for the next game because they can't. You know, the players are probably fatigued. What time is their flight back to England? Are they arriving 3, 4 in the morning? I think anyone that, you know, maybe went out last night knows that getting back in from anywhere at 3, 4 in the morning can affect you for a few days. So, yeah, I would... Uh, no, not, not me, Ned, I'm not me. Everyone except Lennon, yeah. Everyone except Neil. But these things hey. can, can definitely play into it, for sure. Let, let me Darren, let, Darren yes. if, if your point Go is on. correct and you say what yes. happens if all three get through, and I mentioned this to Neil earlier, if they all get through, you then got an all-English semi-final, and that in itself can be quite an intensive fixture, can't it? Yeah. Well, yeah, we, 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 we raised that one, yeah, a little while back and, and, and said that that could be an issue too. I mean, all I would say, Dan, and I think you'll back me up on this, 90 minutes against Atalanta is a lot easier to recover from than a night out with Neil Lennon. <laughs> I think that's... That's, that's a bit harsh, Fletch. <laughs> harsh but true. I noticed you didn't say I was wrong. <laughs> um, <laughs> two o'clock, the game kicks off at Anfield. Liverpool against Crystal Palace. Ian Dennis alongside Neil Lennon for that. Um, Leicester City closing in on an FA Cup final. Are they nearly there, Flo Pollock? 20 minutes into the second half, Darren, and it's Tottenham nil, Leicester one. Still, yeah, Leicester looking the more likely to get a second. They nearly scored straight from the restart. Spurs have brought on top goal scorer Martha Thomas, though, because they're in need of a goal. Tottenham nil, Leicester one. Well, the surprising scoreline in Scotland is Ross County 2, Rangers 1. Rangers were ahead in that game. Rangers starting the day four points behind Celtic. This is one of two games in hand. Now, that could be a pivotal result in the title race in the Scottish Premiership. So, Crystal Palace sit 15th, five points off Luton in 18th. It's now six games under the new manager, Oliver Glasner. In that time, it's only been one win, which was against 10-man uh, Burnley. Um, I watched them last weekend, Jules, against Manchester City, and you can see what he wants to do. Mm. And I know that he feels that having Michael Elise available to him as he is today is going to be advantageous. He's desperate to get Czech Decore back. And at the minute, he wants to play with a back three, but he's having to do it with Jefferson Lerma. Nathaniel yeah. Klein's in there today. He's kind of only getting half a chance at doing what he wants to do, isn't he, right now, Oliver Glasner? Yeah, it's tough. I think it's tough for him. I think he's, it was really good for him to arrive and to finish the season because he would have come in the summer otherwise where things would have been differently. OK, you would have been the pre-season, but I think arriving when he did, you've got a bit of time to settle in in your new life in London. Just everything, even the practical things like finding a house and everything for your family, all of that is helpful. You get to know the league because you finish the season and they will stay up. I don't think they will go down. You stay up, you can try a few things with the players, already working on next season's squad, who you want to keep, who you want to let go, who you're thinking about bringing back, what position you need to strengthen. So I think on, on that side, it was good for him to arrive when he did. On the other side, maybe he's realising how difficult the task is because, as we see, the results are not good. He's trying to implement something that maybe the players are not too responsive with. If you have key players like Eze, like Olize, not, not there or not in their best form, the team is struggling, certainly to create chances because they are your two best players. So I think it's maybe, maybe I think it's realizing for him how difficult even next season could potentially be. But for me, it was good that he arrived when he did because he gained, he gained a lot of time compared to if he had arrived in the summer.
He said last week before the Manchester City match, if he didn't think he could win the game, he would have gone on an open-top bus tour of London with his wife. So he was quite confident they could do that. Whether he's considered taking in the Beatles sites in Liverpool today instead of going to Anfield, we'll wait and see. Um, Rachel, just on, on players that are starting to look a little bit better, maybe under him, Jean-Philippe Mateta's the one that kind of stands out. I think he scored four in six. He took his goal against Manchester City really well last weekend. He's often been a player that gets himself in positions and, and misses them, but he just seems that little bit more confident and clinical under the new manager. Yeah, I, th I think he probably is one that has done well. I think just, you know, and to Jules's point, I, I think it's definitely a, a positive that he's come in at this point and he has the chance to kind of, you know, probably work a little more you know, drip feed, let's say, is philosophies and principles um, and it not be too big or too drastic a change. But equally, I think the world you live in and the, the ruthlessness, he's not going to get much chance to probably, you know, he, there's not going to be too many lives left, I think. He's going to have to start positively um, with a new season. So I think there's probably a bit of pressure on him. They have had a few injuries like everyone else. I don't think it's been overwhelming. I agree, I think they will still be safe. But yeah, I think... It's probably been a tough start, and he probably anticipated that, but it's 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 not been Palace's best season. Yeah, um, there's been a goal scored at Ross County. Could be a big one, Gavin Wallace. Is Neil Lennon still listening? Is he? He that's, is. That's the big question. <laughs> Ross County three. Oh my God! Oh, Rangers oh, my one. Oh my days! Uh, yes, oh my days indeed. Ball down the left hand side. Rangers defenders all at sea. This came right after um, Adela Sima was booked for handling the ball into the net. We thought it was a goal. Referee was straight over to give a yellow card. Ross County get going down the left hand side. It's a, a bit of a calamity for Rangers at the back. The ball's laid off, and Sims from seven yards puts it well beyond Butland. I will repeat that again. Ross County three. Rangers. One. Wow. And Neil Lennon, everybody's telling me that Crystal Palace are going to get rolled over at Anfield. That's exactly what should have happened to Ross County today, wasn't it? Yeah, but it's not easy up there at times. And <laughs> it's not easy winning titles, Fletch, you know. Some of us make it look easy, but it's not, you know. It's, you know, you got to go through the highs and lows, mate. You know? oh, but fantastic. listen, there's still a long way to go on that, trust me. A lot. Not just the game, but in the title running. We've got to play each other again at Celtic Park. And, you know, if any, if last week's anything to go by, it's really difficult to call still. But definitely, if it, it ends up with Rangers getting beat today, it's Celtic on the driving seat then. Absolutely. So Rangers 3-1 down at Ross County and Leicester's women one up at the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium in the FA Cup semi-final against Tottenham. So Liverpool Palace coming up at two. That's on five live and we'll be back at Anfield shortly. But let's head to the London Stadium for the day's other two o'clock kickoff. West Ham against Fulham. Joby McEnough, part of the commentary team on Five Sports Extra for this one. Good afternoon, Joby. Evening. How are you doing, guys? Uh, very good, thank you. So uh, what about this one today? A win against Fulham could potentially put David Moyes' side as high as sixth in the table, depending on other results. It says... Um, a lot that we're at this stage of the season and we're still fighting for a European spot. He said the players have done really well. We need to show that we can go again when it matters. I mean, they're in a situation too where they've got their destiny pretty much in their own hands, but they've just got to keep getting the results, haven't they? Yeah, they have. I think the big test for them, and it has been this season, is after the European Games. Obviously, a real difficult evening at Leverkusen. A team that are having a fantastic season, of course, but... Yes, no, they conceded a couple of late goals, but really tough, tough night's work. I think it would have taken a lot out of the players and they have struggled in terms of getting wins after those European games. So that would be the real question for me today. The squad is really, really thin. I think you look at a couple of the injuries, key players, Jarrod Bowen obviously out at the moment is a big, big miss. And I don't think he's had a lot of options in terms of trying to freshen things up at times. So I think that's been a real issue for them. And I think between now and the end of the season could be a bit of a challenge just to maintain, you know, any decent form to, to really push for those European places. Yeah, it's interesting you say that because I, I, I saw them at Newcastle um, the other Saturday when, when they got the lead and ended up losing the match bizarrely 4-3. But when you looked at it, I think he's made the fewest changes, hasn't he, David Moyes, overall? in the Premier League this season and he's got one of the older starting lineups in terms of average age so it's a testament really to them that they're still in the position they are fighting on all the fronts they're fighting on based on the fact he's not got a great deal by way of option 
Yeah, and that's why I found it fascinating at times this season to hear a little bit of discontent amongst some West Ham fans in terms of probably more style of play than certainly results because you look, as you say, the season that they're having with the circumstances. And I think the manager just wants a really good opportunity to, again, freshen things up at times. I genuinely don't think he's been able to do that. I think the team that he picks nine times out of ten is his strongest team and I don't think the depth is really there. Danny Ings coming in today is an interesting one, someone who's not been in great form and I think that is really where he's at at the moment, trying to maybe trust players that haven't really been performing if he does have to make one or two changes. But overall, you look at the season, as you say, European football again, and then where they are in the league, I think it's been a very successful one for West Ham. Joby, a couple on Fulham. I mean, there aren't too many teams you'd class as mid-table in the Premier League this season. They're either try fighting for their lives to stay in the division or, or they've got a, an outside shot of a European place, but they are a mid-table team and they're very much a mid-table team in terms of the kind of results they get as well, aren't they? I mean, they're up one minute and down the next. Yeah, been a real mixed bag. I've actually seen quite a lot of them recently. I've done a couple of their games. The 3-3 free free, um, against Sheffield United was just absolutely crazy. They actually played really well at times, Fletch. They dominated large parts of the game, but just gave some real poor goals away and actually Forest game. 3-0 down, made three changes after half an hour, Marco Silva. And again, I think for them, just a little bit of, well, a lot of inconsistency this season. Again, another squad that's fairly old in terms of the average age of the squad and probably needs a, a bit of a, a freshen up, but really inconsistent. You never quite know what you're going to get with them. Some real good players and technically gifted talent, but maybe just a bit too leaky, certainly recently defensively. A quick one on Rodrigo Muniz, who's been named the Premier League Player of the Month for March. I mean, they were all concerned about who was going to score the goals when Mitrovic went. Jimenez had a chance earlier in the season, but it looks like they've found one here. He's only 22. He looks a real talent. He does, and I've got to say, he's really surprised me. I saw quite a bit of him, you know, when he was in the Championship, and obviously it's difficult when you are an understudy and, and Mitrovic was clearly, you know, the main man scoring the amount of goals. I think it takes a while. He's a young player still to really take that mantle on and he really has done so well with the goals you can see he's a different player now confident anything in front of goal he looks as though he's going to take his opportunities whereas before he'd get those same chances and he was a little bit snatchy you know wasn't as composed as he is at the moment and as you say for 21 years old you know what he's doing eight goals in his last 10 games at this level is a fantastic return and definitely someone they can work with and, and build in on the future Joby good to talk to you cheers thank you very much that's uh, Joby McEnough, who's alongside John Akers. You can hear West Ham against Fulham on five sports extra. That's a two o'clock kickoff at the London Stadium as well. Two o'clock at Anfield on five live for Liverpool against Crystal Palace. So 20 minutes to go. Leicester lead Tottenham in the first of today's Women's FA Cup semi-finals. Um, Ellen White's going to be with us shortly to look ahead to Manchester United against Chelsea in the other one. Plus, we'll be back at Anfield as we build up to our first Premier League commentary of the day here on Five Live, Liverpool against Crystal Palace with Ian Dennis and Neil Lennon. That's all after the latest BBC News with Dina Campbell. Listen on BBC Sounds. This is BBC Radio Five Live. Rishi Sunak has confirmed that RAF jets shot down a number of Iranian drones fired at Israel overnight. The UK was among several countries, including the US, Jordan and France, which helped Israel defend itself from what it called an unprecedented attack that included over 300 drones and missiles. Israel said it shot down 99% of them. G G7 leaders are holding urgent talks this afternoon as fears of an escalation in the conflict in the, in the Middle East grow. The UN Secretary-General Antonio Guterres said he was deeply alarmed and condemned the attack, which was in response to an Israeli airstrike on an Iranian consulate, consulate building in Syria. Here, the Prime Minister has called for calm. If this attack had been successful, the fallout for regional stability would be hard to overstate. And we stand by the security of Israel and the wider region, which is, of course, important for our security here at home too. And what we now need is for calm heads to prevail. We'll be working with our allies to de-escalate the situation. Meanwhile, Iran has declared the attack a success. Kazran Naji is special correspondent for the BBC's Persian service. 
The officials are claiming complete success. They are saying that they have hit their targets, and uh, but most importantly, they are also saying that, as far as they are concerned, this is it. They don't want to take it any further. This is the conclusion of their the action against Israel for what happened in Damascus on April the 1st. Um, Iranian uh, people are watching, uh, very concerned, because after all, this is picking a big fight uh, with a, a major military power in the region, Israel, if not the major power in the region. In other news, a vigil is taking place in Australia in memory of the six people who were stabbed to death at a shopping centre in Sydney. Police say 40-year-old Joel Couchy, who was shot dead by a police officer responding to the attack, had suffered from mental health problems for decades. Labour's Shadow Home Secretary Yvette Cooper has defended the party's deputy leader, Angela Rayner, in the continuing row about her living arrangements. A former aide has been reported as saying that when he visited her at her husband's address, there was no doubt in his mind that it was her family home. Police are investigating whether she gave false information about her main residence a decade ago. Ms Rayner has insisted that no rules were broken. On BBC iPlayer. So we just want to get to the port, get on one of the ferries. This is probably the biggest moment of the race so far. Get our tickets now. Pressure. Here we go. We could beat them. Come on. This is it. Come on. Race Across the World is back. I don't want to go home. I want more of this. Five intrepid duos travel from Japan to Indonesia. I know it's going to be hard. I don't want it to be easy. With no phones, bank cards or directions. Mum, they're behind us. Run! Brand new Race Across the World continues Wednesday on BBC iPlayer. This is Five Live Sports with Darren Fletcher. On Five Live. Listen on BBC Sounds. Welcome back to Five Live Premier League Sunday in the company of Rachel Corsi, Nedham Anua and Julian Laurence. We've got commentary to come from Anfield at 2 o'clock, Liverpool against Crystal Palace. Then at 4.30, it's Arsenal Aston Villa. And from 2 o'clock on Sports Extra, you can hear West Ham against Fulham. And don't forget, we go right the way through uh, till the Masters concludes tonight. Mark Chapman and the team from 8 o'clock, live from Augusta National for the final round of the US Masters. Let's whiz around the, the games that kicked off at 12 o'clock. There's a real shock in Scotland today. Uh, Ross County leading Rangers and pulling away, Gavin Wallace. They certainly are. Ross County 3, yes, do not adjust your radio. Ross County 3, Rangers 1. Rangers took the lead on 15. It was a Baldwin all goal. And then goals from Murray on 47, Harmon on 50 and Sims on 69. I mean that if, uh, well, obviously it would completely be advantage Celtic in the title race, but from a Ross County point of view, Fletch, it would take them within a point of 10th place St Johnston and really pull them into the mire when it comes to the relegation playoffs. Not long to go, so Ross County 3, Rangers 1. So not long to go there, not long to go either at the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium. Leicester City closing in on a place in the Women's FA Cup final. Flo Pollock. Yes, they are. Tottenham nil, Leicester 1. Leicester are 10 minutes away from a first FA Cup final. Spurs very flat and struggling to create any chances and they are running out of time. Tottenham nil, Leicester 1. So the second semi-final kicks off at 2.35. Manchester United hosting the holders, Chelsea. Uh, Sani Rudrabadula is at the Lee Valley Stadium for this one. Sani, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Well, it's a rerun of last year's final. Chelsea, the holders, beating United by a goal to nil. Their last game was another cup final, losing the Conti Cup to Arsenal by the same scoreline. So for Emma Hayes and a final season at Chelsea, second in WSL, this is another chance to tee up a season end with silverware before she takes over as USA boss. One change for them, Nuskin is out and Guru Wrighton is in. A pressure, though, continues to build on her opposite number. United boss Mark Skinner off the pace, United in four, 15 points behind Manchester City in the WSL. They followed up that Derby Day defeat with a 4-1 win here at Everton. United five unbeaten but after a disappointing season the Cups a good chance maybe to get the fans on the feet here at Lee two changes for United Nikita Paris and Jesse drop out Rachel Williams comes in as the goal scorer against Everton Leah Galton Thank you Sandy you can watch this game on BBC One from 2.25 three time FA Cup winner Ellen White is part of the coverage and she joins us now good afternoon Ellen good afternoon thanks for having me so no goodbye quadruple for Emma Hayes after they lost to Arsenal in the League Cup final, but a treble wouldn't be bad, would it? Pretty average, I'd say. Yeah, not too <laughs> bad. <laughs> 
Yeah, I think, yeah, obviously disappointing, obviously, for them not to, to win that Conti final. And this is their first game back as well. And, you know, at the end of this one, could they be, you know, only on for the double? I don't know. That's still pretty decent. But, yeah, obviously, Manchester United will be doing absolutely everything to get into another cup final as they did last season. Yeah, we'll hear from Emma Hayes shortly. But, Flo, there's been a goal. Yes, they have, and it's a Tottenham leveller. Tottenham won, Leicester City won out of nowhere. Spurs are level as a long ball. The Leicester defender misjudged it. Jess Naz threw on goal, calmly slotted into the bottom corner. Tottenham won, Leicester won. So there's a twist. Now, like Ellen said, Emma Hayes' side still have a lot to play for despite losing the League Cup final. Listen, the team wants to win for themselves. They want to win for the football club. They want to win for their families. They want to win because they're winners. They're sick to death of what they need to do for me. And that's fair. It's not about me. It's about them and us as a collective, making sure we, you know, we maximise the situations we're in. There's three pieces of silverware up for grabs. I'm very grateful to be in the position to be competing for them. And uh, as I said before, we're looking forward to it. Rachel, do you think the players get tired about all of the Emma Hayes chat? Are they thinking about it, talking about it, or just concentrating on themselves? Uh, not really. Obviously, I was away with it with Erin Cuthbert last week, and there's an awareness, there's an understanding. I think when it was announced, it was probably a good thing that, you know, I think it gave players an opportunity at a time in the season when there, there probably wasn't as much pressure to process that information, although I, th I think the information was forced to come out. That I, I think there was a leak, but either way, I think the timing was OK. And I, it probably consumes Emma, Emma more than it does the players, I think. And, um, you know, that that's something that she would have known would have been coming with the fact the decision was made during, you know, the, the middle of a current season. Um, they're stacked full of talent. I think, obviously, it was a difficult outcome in the Conti Cup final and they're a group that I would say deal with adversity quite well, they like the pressure, they like to have this sort of kind of togetherness attitude when it is everyone against them type thing they've they've been in this front runner position so many times, they, they enjoy that I think so um, I'd be surprised, you know they have the opportunity to win the treble, they all, it's also possible that they end up with nothing um, I think it's exciting and for the players I, I know that as well Erin says they just love it it's, it's games every three four days as much as that's tiring as a player you, you absolutely want to be involved in all the games that they've got coming up yeah um, Jules it was in the Telegraph this week Tom Gary reported it that the Leon manager Sonia Bompasta is being lined up as the possible replacement for Emma Hayes, what about what about that? Your thoughts? Yeah, it's almost done. Not really. I find it slightly strange the timing because they can face each other in the Champions League final. For example, Barcelona would play Chelsea, so first Emma Hayes and Chelsea would have to to beat them, the Catalans, and Lyon face PSG in the other semi final. But we can potentially have a Lyon Chelsea final where Sonia Bonpastor will play against the team that she will manage from next season, which I would find quite incredible. But she was on the shortlist from day one, really, and completely deservedly so because she's she's been she's done great things at Lyon. She was obviously one of the greatest players that we've had in in French women his, uh, French women football in history. She was outstanding with the national team at a club level. She was a leader. She was a captain. She was you could tell from very very early that she would become a, a manager and that she would probably become a good manager. And that's why she is now. She's still early in her career, but I think she felt that she's won everything at Lyon, the Champions League, the league, the cup. She potentially can win again the double Champions League and league title this season too. So she felt like, really, this is it. I've done everything here in France. Where could I go now? Well, really, apart from Barcelona, England is the, 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 the biggest country for women's football in Europe. And Chelsea is the biggest club here, really, with the best squads and... Even if you come after Emma Hayes, which is going to be difficult, and I think Sonia knows that, because the expectations, the pressure will be very different to anything she's known before, she, she's ready for the challenge. And for me, she speaks the language too, so it's, uh, she ticks all the boxes, and it's, it's an amazing challenge when you think about it. You say her name so much better than me. Bon Pastor. <laughs> you see, I, I was... The, the English person. No, you spent yeah, a few days in Paris with me this week, so I, I expect your I French know. to be top now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 
<laughs> a penalty in the Ross County Rangers match. Gavin Wallace, is this a twist? It could be a twist. It's a penalty for Rangers. Brandon Keeler has left wrist. Ball floated in, and uh, the defender kind of got things all wrong. He was really up high with his knee up and his wrist up. Referee had a quick check. James Tavernier is about to step up. He's already scored 49 penalties in the year of the Scottish Premiership. We're just waiting. It's the final checks now. He's shooting into the Rangers end. This is the whistle. Can he pull it back? It's the stuttered run-up. And he goes far right! And it's a goal for Rangers. Ross County 3, Rangers 2. So, can they hang on? Rangers back in it, 3-2, Ross County 3-2 up. Neil Lennon's had a little wobble at Anfield. We'll hear from him in a few minutes' time. Um, Ellen Mark Skinner looks like he's going to sign a new contract at Manchester United. Not greeted with that much joy from United fans, but could a win today change all of that? I'm not sure. Um, I think the, the fans obviously have been disappointed with the, the inconsistency with Manchester United this, this season. Obviously, they, they were top... Uh, for a, la a, a long time last season, um, second they ended up. Um, so I'm not sure if it will quite change uh, what the fans are thinking. Um, you know, we've, we've heard about Ineos, haven't we? And they're not 100% concentrating on the women's side right now. Uh, maybe, you know, um, they, they want to just stick with, with Mark Skinner for, for the time being. I don't know. But I think it will galvanise the team to, to know, um, you know, if they do get to an FA Cup final and they could potentially win something, it's obviously very exciting for Manchester United fans in, in wanting to, to go to Wembley and, and be in such a prestigious cup as the FA Cup. And before we let you go, Ellen, just give us your, your verdict on the game this afternoon. How do you see it going? Oh, I was hoping you wouldn't say that. <laughs> 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 let's, uh, do you know what? I always say I want goals. So let's go 4-3 Chelsea. Oh, fantastic. We will take that. Ellen, have a good one. Thanks <laughs> for joining us. Appreciate it. That's uh, Ellen White, who's going to be part of the BBC coverage on BBC One. That starts at 20 past two. Manchester United, Chelsea in the Women's FA Cup semi-final. We'll have updates here on Five Live. It's one all at the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium between Tottenham Hotspur women and Leicester City women. 14 minutes till kick-off then at Anfield. The first commentary on Five Live Sport this afternoon. 4.30, you'll hear Arsenal against Aston Villa, but Liverpool Crystal Palace is the first one today. Let's head back to Anfield and rejoin our commentary team of Ian Dennis and Neil Lennon. Neil, it's not quite over and done with at Ross County, is it? No, I thought the Rangers would have a go in the, the last half an hour. Um, obviously, they got the penalty, so... It's going to be an interesting sort of five or six minutes, but look, if 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 Ross County were to take a point off Rangers or three points, that was a massive bonus that Celtic probably weren't expecting. Fletch, to tell you the truth. Dano, what does it feel like in there today at this point? 14 minutes, they know it's a big game. They lost 3-0 in that stadium on Thursday night. Any nerves that you sense? No, I think um, because obviously they're going to be paying their respects to the... Uh, it's the 35th anniversary of the Hillsborough tragedy. It's just there's there's not... There's not, you know, there are not many flags on the on the cop at this stage, which is always the case, because of uh, you know so close to to the Hillsborough anniversary. So it's just everybody's gearing up to the uh, I think to the the three o'clock. So it's a little bit muted at this stage, understandably so. And then I think once that's out of the way, then the supporters will get behind the team, uh, because Crystal Palace have started well in games, you know, under Oliver Glasner. They've taken the lead in five of the last six games, and Liverpool and Arsenal have both got an opportunity here to put down a bit of a marker because if they win their three next games, including obviously today's, by the time Manchester City next play in the Premier League, they could be seven points behind Arsenal and Liverpool. So both both of those two teams today have got an opportunity in the coming today and coming weeks to try and yeah. psychologically ramp up the pressure on City. Yeah. Are you confident, Nadim, that this is going to be one-way traffic at Anfield this afternoon? Um... Yeah, absolutely. But don't get me wrong, I am wrong probably 51% of the time, so I wouldn't necessarily back me. But you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a I'm a believer in Liverpool being very good at Anfield, and I can't see this Crystal Palace side being able to affect that today. No. Yeah, I should now start introducing you as the modest Ned of Manua, shouldn't I? After that, I'm wrong 51% of the time. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you, what do you think Crystal Palace will do today, Rachel, in terms of turning up at Anfield? As, as Ian's just said. They're good starters. The flip side of that is they've not been very good finishers. So that's the challenge for them, I suppose. Yeah, it is. And it, it's probably a little bit of a balance of, you know, do you do you really change your setup a lot to try and, you know, almost get away from what maybe your your, your principles are a little bit just to try and stay compact in the game? Or, um, you know, how expansive are you willing to be? And 
in the fact that you could try and, and go for it a bit more aggressively. I think what they do have is they've got players that have pace in, in the counter-attack, and I think that's probably where I feel they can maybe get some joy, if any, but I'm probably in the same train as Nadam <laughs> and that the fact that I'm wrong more than I'm right but I, just, <laughs> I, I probably can only see Liverpool coming away with three points today I think it'll be really tough for Palace they're going to probably have to really defend very very well and hope they get the rub of the green a little bit Jules Mo Salah's been fine four in six just just one in five though for Darwin Nunez has he got to kind of hit his straps at this stage he needs a bit of support up there doesn't he Mo yeah. Salah yeah, I think he does. Uh, and Darwin provided uh, an assist against United, for example, and I think he worked so hard for the team, especially in, in out of possession, the, the pressing, the counter pressing. He gives you so much. I think that front three complement each other really well. This is not new. We've been used to watching them, Luis Diaz and what he brings, and Darwin, what he brings, and then Salah, obviously. When we talked, we talked about that start, about how many shots they need to score. Remember the Salah against Brighton, 12 shots, one goal. And I think this is a little bit symptomatic of where they are right now. And today will be interesting to see. We all agree they're going to win, but it's how they win. Curtis Jones coming back in midfield. This is really important, I think, for them. Soboslai has, has done well, but when Soboslai play, you often move McAllister a little bit more on the other side. And I think McAllister is much better on the right-hand side. Curtis Jones is better on the left-hand side. For me, this is a more balanced and maybe more effective midfield three with Endo. Whether you like Endo or not, it's a different, different discussion. But certainly for McAllister and, and Curtis Jones, that might work well. And I think they've missed Curtis Jones this season when he was injured. Uh, just to update you, they're into stoppage time. Ross County 3, Rangers 2 in the Scottish Premiership. And as it stands, they're heading to extra time at the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium. The late Tottenham goal makes it Spurs 1, Leicester City 1 in the first of the Women's FA Cup semi-finals. 2.35 kick-off at Lee Sports Village for Manchester United women against Chelsea women. Um, Neil, as a manager at this stage of the season, put yourself in, in, in the shoes of Jurgen Klopp. You've been in numerous um, title chases as the Celtic manager. Are there certain things that you do? Are there certain things that you say? What, what kind of things go through a manager's mind at this stage of a season? Well, it's exciting for a start because they've done a hell of a lot of work to get into this position. They don't want to give it up lately. That'll be what he'll be saying to the players. And obviously off the back of Thursday night, you know, use the, the hurt that you're feeling as a motivation for today. Um, you know, I, I, I don't see much wrong with their attitude, Fletch, and the way they approach every game. You know, he's got great trust in the players on, on that aspect. So I think he'll be, I think he'll be, like, if you can be in this situation, he'll be relaxed about it. I think he'll be looking for, the, the big word for me is reaction. Reaction, reaction, reaction. Get a reaction from Thursday night. Go out there, get on the front foot and sort of allay any sort of worries or any tension that's out there. They're really good. I know people are talking about Palace starting well, but I can't see that today. I watched them at the Etihad early on the season with the ground out of 2-2 draw, unbelievably. I can't see that happening today, though. I just think it'll be front foot Liverpool and Palace having to hang on for any any scraps that can get, really. Yeah, just to recap the table as it stands, Manchester City top on 73. They've played 32 matches. Um, Arsenal next, 71 points after 31. They kick off at half past four. And Liverpool 71 after 31 as well. I think one of the underestimated aspects of this title race, though, Nadam, the goal difference situation. Liverpool a third out of three in that regard and nine worse off at this stage than Arsenal. I mean, that could be hugely significant. Yeah, absolutely could. And to be honest, I think City were third before that game yesterday. But I think this is where I believe, so let's say, Arsenal deserve a lot of credit because I think it was around the time when they were in the Cups and they went and I think they went to, they got knocked out of the Epic Cup and they went to Dubai. And there were jokes about Arteta and him seeing Salt Bay, all that stuff. But they came back and they went on the, the five game stretch where they scored the most goals that they'd ever done in, in their Premier League history. And all of a sudden, they're the team with the best goal difference now. They're the team with all the confidence. And I think goal difference for them, like that being in their favour was huge because that really propelled them towards being at the top of the league right now. So I think it, I think it does, well, it might matter. It's definitely something to think about. And I just worry for whichever team ends up finishing second, if it's due to goal difference, like how would you recover from that? Nadam, can I ask you, where do you see City compared to now, the last year? Um, I don't think they're as good as they were last year. I think that's due to, say, certain players being unavailable, like De Bruyne for the first half of the season, senior players like Gundogan's and Mahrez leaving. 
but as we can see, they're still very, very capable. And I, I think the last time they lost the game was, I think, to Aston Villa at the start of December. So they've sneakily, even though they're not top of the league by a margin, you know, they are playing some of the best football in the business end of the season. So somehow, even with losses in terms of personnel, they're still very, very good, aren't they, Neil? Yeah. Uh, I think it's 27 games unbeaten for Manchester City and the fact they still don't have their title destiny in their in their own hands is a testament to how well Liverpool and Arsenal have done alongside them uh, this season. So they've reached the end of normal time in the first uh, Women's FA Cup semi-final at the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium, heading to extra time, Flo Pollock. Yes, they are. Tottenham won, Leicester won. Leicester led for most of the game and Tottenham woke up, though, in the final 10 minutes. Jessica Naz drawing them level on the 82nd minute. Extra time coming. Tottenham won, Leicester won. And there's been a twist in the title race in Scotland. The day's off to a rip-roaring start for Neil Lennon. Gavin Wallace. It certainly is Ross County's first ever win against Rangers. Ross County 3, Rangers 2. Murray, Harmon and Sims making sure that they win. It was an own goal from Baldwin and Tavernier from the spot. Makes Rangers 4 behind Celtic with a game in hand. Ross County 3, Rangers 2. Rachel, Nedham, Jules, thank you very much for your company today. Uh, been fantastic having you with us on Five Live Premier League Sunday, as always. So 4.30 coming up. Um, full commentary, Arsenal Aston Villa in the Premier League at 2 o'clock. The choice of listening on Five Sports Extra, West Ham, Fulham from the London Stadium here on Five Live. Commentary coming up of Liverpool against Crystal Palace. But some things are more important than football. Monday marks the 35th year since 97 Liverpool fans died following a crush at Hillsborough before an FA Cup semi-final against Nottingham Forest. As Anfield gets ready to remember those who lost their lives and the many more that day who were impacted, here's your commentary team, Neil Lennon and Ian Dennis. Yes, thank you, Darren. The two teams yet to come out here at Anfield. The clouds are high, the sun is trying to burst its way through. There are some overcast clouds in the uh, in the distance as Anfield is a sellout the redeveloped Anfield road end away towards our left hand side and in the bottom tier half of that is filled by those who've travelled up from South London from Crystal Palace but Liverpool the majority of supporters inside Anfield will be expecting a reaction as Virgil van Dijk waits to lead out Liverpool and Jurgen Klopp has made five changes from the side that lost to Atalanta in the Europa League quarter-final on Thursday night. Alisson is back in goal. They've missed him. 14 games, he's been absent with a thigh injury. He comes for Kelleher, Diaz, Salah, Robertson and Bradley for Gakpo, Elliot, Simakas and Gomez as Virgil van Dijk leads out Liverpool with a right hand on the small little mascot, the little boy with his fair hair. Allison has two mascots either side of him as Anderson leads out Crystal Palace and they've made two changes from the side that played against Manchester City, Elise for Ayu and Klein against his former club for Ward. As the Premier League anthem is sounded, Crystal Palace you would think are safe, but what a game at the top of the table for Liverpool. Neil yeah, Lennon. I think um, I think all the emphasis here for us today, then it was Liverpool, you know, going for that title. You know, off the back of a, you know, a shock, and it was a shock result on Thursday. Totally uncharacteristic from this Liverpool side. Palace will have their own sort of um, motivations for the game. Glasgow will want to try and bed down his own philosophy. You know, for now, going into the next season. But for today, it's the reaction that you're looking for from these Liverpool players. They've been over the course and distance before.
singing inside Anfield on what is a significant and poignant date in the club's history and the city of Liverpool as we will now remember those that died, their families, the survivors and those still impacted. Of the Hillsborough disaster. Today we observe a period of silence for the 97 Liverpool supporters who lost their lives. They will never be forgotten. For those of you on the cop, please raise your mosaic cards now. The silence starts on the referee's whistle. figures of 97 amidst the red, yellow and white and tomorrow on the actual day of the Hillsborough tragedy the players and staff will fall silent at 3.06 to observe a minute of silence in memory of the 97, the men, women and children who lost their lives. There's now Liverpool in all red, former team huddle, Crystal Palace in their white shirts and sky blue shorts and uh, extremely emotional afternoon, Neil Lennon. Oh, that was beautifully observed. And I have to say that, you know, every single person in the stadium was so silent and just, you know, what a tragedy. I remember it very, very well, very vividly. So, yeah, it's emotional, but they've got to put the emotion to one side now and, uh, you know, concentrate on what's a, a massive afternoon for Liverpool in this title running. Well, I remember being here eight years ago on this day, Liverpool played Borussia Dortmund in the Europa League and uh, they performed one of the great European comebacks that particular night. Lovren popping up with a, an injury time goal, which uh, certainly they didn't start well that night. Borussia Dortmund had raced into a 2 0 lead, if my memory serves me correctly. And Crystal Palace, who started well in games under Oliver Glasner. They're playing from left to right, they're quickly on the front foot, out towards the left, and the cross comes in from Mitchell. And Allison back in the starting lineup, dive forward and manage to, uh, to push the ball away. This is the closest title race in England's top division since 75 76, when four teams were separated by a point after 31 games as Palace come forward again and Ezra with a shot at Allison. Liverpool, incidentally, went on to win the title that year. Whether they will this time, only time will tell, but there is certainly no margin for error. That's not exactly the start they wanted. Already Mitchell's put a cross in that Allison had to come and deal with. And then Nezzy works with a little bit of magic on the edge of the box and, and gets a shot away. So a little bit sluggish from Liverpool already. But Allison really sharp off his line there. Neil Lennon with us here on BBC Radio 5 Live. Bradley on that far side, the right, up towards Salah. Hasn't been himself since he came back from injury, Mo Salah. And they've taken a quick free kick, too <laughs> quick, says referee Chris Cavanagh, and he wants play brought back just over the halfway line. I like the way he was thinking there. Nunez was on the run, but he's like 10 yards away from where the, the free kick was uh, supposed to be taken. 15 goals in 21 before his injury, two in four since, and certainly Liverpool. Their finishing has been an issue this season as they try and get forward, but Hughes on the half volley clips it up towards Mateta. Certainly he has blossomed since Oliver Glasner took over. As the ball cleared by Canate, Mitchell the left wing back inside to Lerma, plays the left of the three, Anderson and Klein make up that three-man defence for Crystal Palace, as Endo to Van Dijk, quickly out towards Robertson, 
made his debut against Crystal Palace back in 2017 for what was a, a victory at home by a, a goal to nil. We'll take that today, although with a goal difference they'd maybe like a few more. That could well be a factor. Robertson forward gets a throw near side the left. They're attacking the Anfield Road end, all in red. BBC Radio 5 Live, two and a half minutes played. Jones nudges the ball in field. McAllister, midway through the Crystal Palace half central. Bradley. Out, then it goes to that far side. Ball shifted inside by Salah. Bradley's first cross was blocked. Comes back to the Northern Ireland International. Plays it towards McAllister. McAllister being tracked by Hughes, forces the ball out wide, too far ahead of Bradley, and out of play, it goes for the throw. When you've been in this situation, and I know Darren asked you the question before, but do you feel the nerves? Of course, yeah. Yeah, yeah. of course you do. You wouldn't be a human being if you didn't feel the nerves, you know, but um, you just got to play the game. You got to. This is the best time for Jürgen now. The game's underway and he can get lost in the game. It's just the, the build-up that'll be, you know... And what about from a player's point of view? Yeah, they just want to get on with the game now, you know, just the, 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 the main focus, and I know it's an old cliche, it's just we're in the present, just look after this game now, and then we'll deal with what comes ahead afterwards, but, you know, you've got a, a fine team in front of you that you have to beat, you have to respect, it's not all about us, we may have to earn the right to win this game. Do you thrive on the pressure? Oh, yeah, first is a privilege, isn't it? Five titles as a, as a player, five as a manager during his time at Celtic, and Celtic might be on course for another title this season as well after struggling Ross County beat Rangers by three goals to two. So their leader at the top remains four points and Rangers now only have one game in hand. Four minutes played here at Anfield. We've got Arsenal Aston Villa to come at 4.30, by the way. I'm just looking at Stephen Bradley's position. He's right up there inside Mo Salah, almost like a number eight position. And then Endo drops back in to play with the two centre-halves. You know, the, the, we talk about this inverted fullback these days, but he's really high there for a fullback when the ball is in this half of the pitch. Ian. He's definitely impressed, hasn't he? Here is uh, Connor Bradley on that far side. He started 16 of the last 20. He did miss a couple of games after the, uh, the passing of his father in February. Here is uh, Jones, Virgil van Dijk, five minutes played. Nil nil, it remains in the early stages here. Here is van Dijk spreading play out towards Salah. Finds him, lays it off. McAllister, the return ball to Salah. And Lerma came across and won that sliding challenge and passes the ball forward to, uh, to Ezra. But Endo, as Neil Lennon was saying, filling in there for, uh, for Bradley. And Bradley now, still coming back from that high position, inverted, uh, now gives it to, uh, to Endo. He offers you the insurance, doesn't he, Endo? Endo, yeah, it's so important in this um, formation. Listen, the number six is always so important, but he did a great job there. Could, Bradley makes a run inside and it opens up the pitch for Van Dijk to switch it out to Salah then. But um, I have to say, Palace have started quite bright, Ian. You know, they're popping it about and they look, you know, quite comfortable on the ball at the minute. They've done well, actually, in the northwest this season. If you, uh, you look at their results, 1-2 uh, and drawn 2. They've won away at Burnley and Manchester United. Got a draw at Manchester City uh, and Everton. 2-0 down at Manchester City under, under Roy Hodgson. Never felt when... Roy was in charge that they were going to get relegated. No. Uh, Oliver Glasner's taken five points from his last six. Roy's last six, seven points from six. And uh, when Oliver Glasner talks about, well, we've got to build the basement first of all, I think you'll find Roy Hodgson did that. This is uh, an 11th successive season in the top flight for Crystal Palace. They've got to kick on. The basement's already been built. Here is uh, Endo. Canate, forward ball, Luis Diaz, central area. 25 yards out from goal, gives the ball away, tries to win it back. Ezra rolls clear of him, though. Wharton oh. gives it back to Ezra. Nice little layoff. Ezra now towards Mateta. Van Dijk was just dropping off, so he's played Mateta onside as he runs over towards that far side. Mitchell provides the support. The two Crystal Palace players between them keep it alive. Back it goes to Hughes. Infield to Wharton on the slide. Tried to nudge it to Elise. And Van Dijk can't pass it back to Allison because of Mateta's presence. In the end, they've lost the ball of uh, Liverpool. And Crystal Palace now, as the sun decides to come out here at Anfield, still attacking. And it's with, uh, with Ezra, left-hand side, loses the ball, McAllister plays it back, Bradley infield to Canate, along the ground to Salah. Crystal Palace, though, are pressing, they've won the ball back, low cross comes in from Mitchell on the left, and Allison now bowls it out. And Robertson, forward, in between two Crystal Palace players, finds Luis Diaz, he's got Nunez. 
and Robertson has continued his run. Now finds Nunez, first time shot, easily patted down by Dean Henderson. Amazing, amazing football. I mean, it's just so chaotic from one end of the pitch to the other. A great passage to play from Palace. Cross comes in, Allison cleans it up, and then straight out there, Robertson, two one twos, and uh, Diaz was able to play. Nunez in, but the angle was too tight for scoring from that angle. It was a great move in, great counter attack. Now, currently on Sports Extra, West Ham Fulham, and there's been a goal. Sahel Sahi. It's gone to Fulham against the run of play in. It's West Ham nil. Fulham won the goal coming after nine minutes. It was a crossfield ball from the right hand side. A mistake from Mavropanos. Pereira latched onto into the penalty area and slotted it home in the dead centre of the penalty box. West Ham nil, Fulham won. Commentary of that's on Sports Extra. This is Five Live and BBC Sounds. Van Dijk to Robertson on the halfway line. Curtis Jones makes himself available ahead of the Scottish international. Elise back in the uh, starting lineup. They've uh, certainly missed Michael Elise. He played the last 16 minutes against Manchester City, but missed the previous seven with a, a thigh injury. But regardless who the manager is for Crystal Palace, when you're missing Eza and Elise, yes. two talented yes. players. They look, they look a different team when those two. I know it's an old cliche, but yeah, they look far more vibrant when those two are in the team. And I have to say, Mateta has had a good spell on the Glasner. He looks fitter, Ian. He looks like he's trimmed down. He looks in a lot better condition. And you know, you can see that he's, he can be a handful. And he's got his fair share of goals lately. Yes, he has five goals in nine in the Premier League since the start of February. Today, incidentally, is his 100th appearance for Crystal Palace. Jean Philippe Mateta. Nine minutes played. In the sunshine at Anfield. 0 0, Liverpool and Crystal Palace. Elise backing into Endo. Kept in play by Stumbling Jones on the halfway line. Oliver Glasner, the Austrian, applauds. Jurgen Klopp in his technical area, likewise, with a big thick coat on and a baseball cap, shielding the sun from his eyes as Canate and Endo just outside the centre circle of the Liverpool half as they defend the cop. Over the halfway line, it's with Robertson. Back inside to the Japanese international. And now with Kanate, Connor Bradley still wide right at the moment, just over the halfway line, but it goes, ball goes forward, Jones to Robertson, midway through the Crystal Palace half, back to Endo once again. Bradley's ventured a good 15, 20 yards further forward now. Diagonal ball aimed towards Salah, brought under the air by Nunez, just outside the D. Nunez finds Bradley, right corner of the area. Bradley waits, McAllister makes himself available, forward ball by McAllister, Nunez I think was mindful he was coming back from an offside position, didn't attempt to go for the ball, he runs straight past him and out for a goal yeah, kick, 0-0. It came back to him, I think they wanted him to flip it, you know, because Diaz on, Jones had made a run in at the far post, I know what he's trying to do, he's trying to slip Nunez back in, but he obviously thought he was offside, but decent passage of play there from Liverpool. It's interesting watching Salah from up here, just a little sort of areas he's picking up, he's not wide, I think, well, he varies his positions in. Sometimes he's red right out wide, but other times when Bradley comes in, comes wide, he'll go and step into the number eight pocket, and um, you know they don't want they overload it with him and Nunez in there, and people Liam is not too sure whether to go with him or not. Well, Salah was after that ball, but Anderson got there first with his header. Nunez picks it up, carves it forward to Diaz. Sliding out was Anderson again. Nunez there is forward. The two of them have got history, remember. Nunez was uh, sent off in his home debut for a headbutt against Anderson, the Danish international, as Luis Diaz. That was last season. McAllister plays it back to Canate. Outside the centre circle. Endo now out towards Robertson. First time ball. Anderson is there at the back for Palace. Sloppy by Elise, but then it runs off the shins of Robertson. And much to his dismay, goes out of play for, uh, for a throw. So we've been playing for 11 minutes and it's still nil-nil. He's looked bright, Nunez, though. He's picked up a couple of second balls and kept prompting the attacks. Looks really hungry today for work and hungry for the ball. Good passage to play again from Liverpool. They're starting to sort of put the foot on the gas a little bit and keep uh, Palace penned in. Munoz with the uh, the throw for Crystal Palace. He's played every minute since he, uh, he arrived, the Colombian from, uh, from Genk in January for just under £7 million. Have you seen much of Wharton? I have, I think he's yeah, quite tidy. So did I. I liked him at Blackburn, and um, he started this game pretty well. Really nice footballer, Ian. Yeah. Good balance as well. There he is with his uh, short, fair, cropped hair. Quite slight, isn't he, still, as a 19-year-old. As a Doesn't turn 20 until June. But I've, uh, I've seen him a couple of times, actually, in the flesh. Very, very tidy midfielder. Oh, good touch. £18 million they bought him from Blackburn Rovers. Jones gives the ball away. 
Munoz made a couple of good additions in the uh, in the January window in that, in that respect at uh, Crystal Palace. And both of them actually haven't missed uh, a game since they arrived, both Wharton and Munoz. Back it goes to, uh, to Allison. He was under pressure by Mateta. Out to Robertson, sliced his clearance, and it'll be a Crystal Palace throw on this near side, the right, level with the penalty area. Munoz takes it quickly, hooks it in field, off the chest by Elise. Mitchell's got forward on that far side, the left. Totally unmarked at the moment. Back it goes, though, to Lerma, just outside the centre circle. Anderson now will come forward. Anderson will switch play out towards Mitchell, who remains... Isolated, feeds it forward. Elise closed down by McAllister. Loose ball picked up by Mitchell. Crystal Palace forward on that far side, the left. Rolled back by Elise. Every outfield player is in the Liverpool half as we look as the Crystal Palace side play in their white shirts and sky blue shorts from left to right. Wharton to Hughes, bypasses Hughes actually, runs out towards Elise. Early ball, Mitchell's ahead of him, left hand side. Mitchell with the cross. That is a brilliant goal by Crystal Palace. That was superb. They were patient and they picked apart the Liverpool defence. And yet again, they take the lead. That is six out of seven under Oliver Glasner that Palace strike first and they lead it Anfield by a goal to nil. Yeah, I'm just looking at Jurgen Klopp's um, reaction. He's gone... I'm a good lip reader, he's gone, wow. That was a brilliant move from Crystal Palace. There must have been about nine or ten passes in the interchange then to get it a little break down the left-hand side. Lovely cutback, and there's Ezzy free in the box. Now, Ian, when, you, when you're playing the way... This is the first time I've seen Liverpool lay for a while. When you're playing your full so high and wide, there's a jeopardy to that when you lose the ball. And they're obviously down this left-hand side, Palace's left-hand side, they're getting a lot of joy because Bradley's just, you know, sort, sort of roaming, wandering, and that's obviously the way he's been told to play. But, like I say, there's a jeopardy to this, and they've been punished. Endo can't get there to stop the cross. Kanata is not picking up, Van Dijk's not picking up, and it's a simple goal, but thoroughly deserved, beautifully worked move. How does somebody with the quality and the talent of Everici Eze be allowed so much space in the penalty area? He's just drifted off, Kanati's ball watching, Van Dijk had Mateta, but Kanati's obviously marking the space, and you know most nine times out of ten in modern football, when fullbacks get to those byline positions, they either dink it or they cut it back, and I just think that he's not seen what's coming into the box, Kanati. But it was worked far too easy down that left-hand stadium. You know, the Liverpool haven't got their distances right in midfield. They're so open. And um, this is the Kamikaze approach sometimes that they take. I've got to say, it was a brilliant goal. Brilliant goal, Super brilliant move. Superbly worked by, uh, by Crystal Palace. And their fine record in the northwest could well be continuing. And Mateta makes the run in behind Canate. All of a sudden, there is uh, an anxiety around Anfield as Mateta... Tries to flick it offside, coming back from an offside position. But this is Liverpool's 32nd game this season. That's 18 times that they've fallen behind in those games, which is quite staggering when you think that they are still in with the uh, in the title. It's not what I was expecting, right? Because it's been quite passive from Liverpool, particularly in midfield. Very, very gentle start. Slow, you know, slow with the ball. I'm giving the ball away, you know, and... Uh, against good opposition the way you think Palace are a good team or not you have to respect them they're a Premier League team and they've got good individuals and here they come again Ezra the goal scorer runs into Canate and that was like running into a brick wall and Ezra has stayed down on the edge of the area as Liverpool clear it referee Chris Kavanagh said no free kick Ezra though is still in a lot of pain and still with his back on the floor Alisson actually is trying to get the attentions of his teammates for them to put the ball out of play to alert the physios to say that You've got a teammate here who's struggling. Instead, it goes back to Henderson, launches the ball long. There's and now he's back to his feet at least. Crystal Palace lead by a goal to nil. 16 minutes played here on five live. Robertson to Van Dyke. As and now running back, but still actually holding what is his left shoulder. Endo on the halfway line. Robertson ahead of him. Crystal Palace have got everybody back. As is still holding it. You have to keep a, an eye on that as McAllister out towards Bradley on that far side. Let's get an update in the women's FA Cup semi-final. Tottenham Leicester, Flo Pollock. Half-time in extra time, Tottenham won, Leicester won. Leicester came close in the first period, hitting the bar from a free kick. 15 minutes of extra time remaining, then penalties if required. Tottenham won, Leicester won. And the Crystal Palace did take the lead last week against Manchester City. They poked the bear as Diaz with a cross. Not properly dealt with by Mitchell. Headed by Bradley, cleared by Lerma towards Eze far side. Rolls it forward. Oh, oh there's a slip, and Mateta's away. 
and Mateta now in on goal, slipped by Van Dijk, Mateta goal words, hooked off the line, brilliant bit of defending by Andrew Robertson, never gave up the chase, it was going goalwards, and just in the last ditch attempt, hooked it away. That is absolutely awesome, Ian. What a brilliant passage of football that is. Again, the out ball is Eze, because Conor Bradley's up the field. He's been a great out ball for Palace. He just rolls the ball into Matera. It's a poor ball, but Van Dijk slips. He's Matera, clean through, one-on-one. -on -one. I thought he was a bit casual with the finish. He dinks it over Alisson, but you've got to give Robertson... A, huge amount of credit, never give up on it and makes an unbelievable goal saving tackle on the line honestly what's a clearance that was that's just pure determination and grit and we're seeing it now on the screen, he couldn't attend it any better, that's just a player not giving up, it's just world class from Andy Robertson. That was just sheer desire Yeah, total He couldn't have left it any later either. But how much of a wake up call do Liverpool need oh. here Ian? They've been so one paced at the minute you know, Henderson's hardly had a look, and this is not the start I was expecting at all. And credit the Palace, they're playing brilliantly. And they're playing with a great deal of confidence at the moment, and they're leading by a goal to nil, which will give Arsenal supporters on the way to their home game against Aston Villa at the Emirates so much heart. As Ezra again is forward, runs into Canate, Liverpool at the minute just can't seem to click. They were looking for a reaction after that defeat against Atalanta. They were so poor on Thursday night. It could easily have been more. Atalanta squandered. Hope Miners had at least two other good chances to, uh, to add to that 3-0 lead. But Liverpool, 19 minutes in, haven't clicked yet, and Crystal Palace, had it not been for Robertson, would have been 2-0 up. For me, the game's too stretched for Liverpool, and I know that's the way they like to play. It's almost like a game of basketball at the minute, you attack and wheel attack, but they're getting no real sort of... Um, passages to play with and get it up the pitch the sloppy in possession and then when the, on the turnovers they're nowhere near the opposition Robertson closes down Munoz, Munoz gets the throw on this near side, 19 minutes played, Crystal Palace lead by a goal to nil you have to go back to March 2021 for the last time that Liverpool failed to score in back to back home games They've got a very good record of it finding the net. They failed to score just twice in their last 60 games. But at the minute, they've been below par. And Crystal Palace are the better side. Offside, though, against Mitchell on that far side. Free kick to Liverpool that McAllister will let Canate take. Jurgen Klopp patrolling that technical area down below. Liverpool 1-0 down. Allison. Forward to McAllister, tracked by Hughes. Sure, during his derby days, he was being heavily linked with uh, with Liverpool when he first broke out as uh, a promising teenager. I think his contract runs out at Crystal Palace come the summer. Will Hughes with that shock oh. of blonde hair. That was almost a risky ball to Canate. Allison forward ball, Endo. They beat the press eventually, although they play it back to Endo and he was on the stretch as Mateta... You're right, Neil, he does look a lot leaner. Jean-Philippe Mateta giving chase. Alisson clears. Nunez rises in the air. Anderson's sliding clearance, picked up by Jones to Salah, and then cleared by Anderson, chested forward by Van Dijk. Liverpool looking for an equaliser as we approach the midway point in the first half. Robertson didn't keep the ball in play. It'll be a Crystal Palace throw on this near side. Yeah, it sums Liverpool up at the minute, sort of nearly there. A little bit bitty. Oh, is that Lerma? I think he's gone down by an injury here, Ian. So Lerma is, uh, is down. I mean, at the minute, you've got Nathaniel Klein as a right-back and Jefferson Lerma as a midfielder, helping out with that three-man defence. Well, I think he's just a bit winded with the way he landed from the challenge on Nunez in the air. He's all right to, uh, to continue. He's started well. He has. Certainly uh, better than his last visit here, which was Bournemouth, when he was beaten by... Nine goals to nil in August 2022. West Ham, Fulham in the other two o'clock game, Sahel Sahi. 23 minutes played, West Ham nil, Fulham won the goal coming after nine minutes through Andreas Pereira. West Ham were on top until Fulham scored. Since then, Fulham have been on top. West Ham nil, Fulham won. Excellent sliding challenge by Lerma, he certainly recovered there to stop the track of uh, the run of Nunez. Jones picks it up, sliding challenge comes in on Jones, goes behind for a corner kick. West Ham, Fulham incidentally is on Sports Extra. 
but at a packed out Anfield, Liverpool have got a corner kick near side the left. Yeah, it was a nice move down the left. Jones got the wrong side of Munoz, but he made a great recovery tackle for the corner. This is a real test for Liverpool. You know, they're just going to have to dig in here and just play with a little bit more urgency and sharpness. Robertson then with the corner kick. Three strides back, left footed, near side the left. It's an out swinger. Canate was there. Runs off his body, picked up by Elise, out of the penalty area, forced to return. Klein clears. Head of goes to the side from McAllister to Robertson on this near left-hand side, 30 yards out from goal. To Nunez, tries to scoop the ball back to Robertson. Robertson will win a corner kick. Oh, he's given a goal kick. Oh, he's given the goal kick. Klein went in, last touch must have been off Robertson. Klein did well. It's a good foot chase between the two. Thought the last touch came off Klein. What a player he is, though, Andy Robertson. I mean... Every game he gives us all, and he's just single-handedly at the minute trying to drag his team back into this, you know, and get the ante up, get the tempo up, you know, get the crowd going. He's already saved the goal for his team, and now he's the driving force down this left-hand side. Incredible bit of defending for uh, Andy Robertson with that goal line clearance, otherwise Crystal Palace would have been two goals to the good. Neil Lennon with us here on BBC Radio 5 Live, midway through this first half. Liverpool behind, Endo. Yet to be on the losing side when he started games in the Premier League for Liverpool. Anderson out of defence, heads it forward, strikes the head of McAllister, falls for Luis Diaz, up against his fellow Colombian Munoz. Goes on the outside, beats him for pace, Diaz still going, Munoz leans into him, the referee though says no penalty. As the ball is picked up by Henderson and Chris Kavanagh was well positioned. Not sure there was enough in that, Ian, I'd love to see it again, but great player from Diaz, he looks like he's got the, the legs on Munoz, Drives past him, gets away from Anderson. No, there's nothing in that, really. It's just uh, coming together, really. Meanwhile, Elise is forward. Good game of football. Crystal Palace is certainly contributing oh, to that. Elise, I could watch footwork. him all day, Ian. <laughs> Honestly, he's beautiful to watch. I'm a big fan of Ezra, the way that he just glides. Well, the glide, him and yeah. Elise. You know, he's got a beautiful left foot as well. Here's Ezzy now. Here he is, the goal scorer for Crystal Palace, who still have that slender advantage in the 25th minute. Tricky sort of player. Uh, he thought he'd got a throw on that far side, the left, but Chris Kavanagh has said it will be a Liverpool free kick. When I mentioned that Liverpool have fallen behind in what is now 18 times this season, they do have, or they have won the most points from losing positions in the Premier League this season. They've claimed back 27, and they're going to have to do that again, because as we said at the very start, you know, there is no margin for error. As M Nunez battles for the ball, chips it forward, Salah will give chase, Henderson quickly off his goal line, good anticipation, gets there for Crystal Palace. Ian, he's done the hard bit brilliantly, and then he's only got a little pass into Diaz, and Diaz would have been in, he's tried the, the difficult scoop over the top for Salah, again, you know, Nunez showing willingness, but just that, that lack of uh, quality at the end, and here they go again down this left-hand side, it's too easy at the minute for me, for uh, Palace to get out. Here is uh, Hughes, back it goes to Jockey Manderson, the only Crystal Palace player to have started all 32 Premier League games now. As Wharton rolls it out, ball from Mitchell infield to Ezra, tried with the outside of his right boot to hit it forward to Mateta, took a deflection, allows Connor Bradley to clear, closed down by, by Mitchell, and it will be a Liverpool throw down by the corner flag in front of the Sir Kenny Dalglish stand and the, uh, the cop over on that far side. 26 minutes played. And Crystal Palace still lead by a goal to nil. And here we were beforehand talking about potentially the chance for Arsenal and Liverpool, who could go seven points clear of Manchester City before the champions are next in action at, uh, against Brighton on the 25th of April. We can rule Liverpool out of that equation at the moment. Robertson. Could be a, a costly setback this for Jurgen Klopp's side. Diaz forward to Robertson. Robertson, though, single-handedly on the charge, wins a corner kick. He has been so impressive for Liverpool down this left-hand side. Liverpool corner. That's fantastic again. Great drive, great speed, great quality. Lovely little ball over the top from Diaz, but the run Robertson makes, about 50, 60 yards. Heads a pass, Klein. Klein can't get to him, and Anderson has to make the block from the cross. Brilliant from Robertson. You need a breather now, Ian, will he not? He will. He's just had a... A short one, but he's in action again. He's involved with this corner kick. Left-hand side, another outswinger. Left-footed from Robertson. Canate's there. Van Dijk can't dig it out. Ball hits the crossbar. It was from Endo falling backwards. Comes towards McAllister, edge of the area. Liverpool come close to an equaliser. 
played forward by Bradley. Brought very well out of the air by Luis Diaz. Salah, right-hand side, scoops over the cross. Nunez has stayed forward, stabbed back to Van Dijk by Jones. Jones, left-hand side of the penalty area. Liverpool pressing now. Jones enters the box, cuts it back. There is Wharton to clear the ball away. Crystal Palace survive. Liverpool kept out by the crossbar and what would have been a third goal for uh, Endo falling back. Liverpool just starting to get into their stride now. It was a funny one, that. The ball just they seemed to be slow motion and it popped, popped out to Van Dijk. He couldn't get it out of his feet, but then Endo took a swipe at it and a little dink off the crossbar and came back out, so Palace surveyed, but it's not brilliant play from Liverpool, but the quality in the front three could be the difference in this game. 28 minutes played, Bradley forward, McAllister with the cross, headed out by Klein. Right of the three-man defence, but he was quite central there, Nathaniel Klein, as he stooped to head it away. Anderson back in position, marshalling that defence now. Munoz comes out of his, what was a flat back five there, just to try and close down the run of Robertson. The two of them just square off a fraction. Endo's forward ball, McAllister almost trying to draw Hughes in. Then it goes back to Endo, in between the two central defenders, Canate's forward ball, Diaz centrally, lays it off towards Jones, creates the run on the overlap for Robertson, it's a first-time cross, Diaz! The keeper got a touch to that, I think, behind for a corner kick, what a save that was from Henderson, from well, a flying Luis Diaz. Absolutely brilliant football, brilliant, what a save, what a, what a move. Canate into Diaz, Diaz out to Robertson, beautiful first-time cross in. Diaz arriving at the far post, Scissor kicks it in the air, almost goes in at the near post, and Henderson has to punch it away. It was Brilliant just, football, Ian. Just a, a swish of the left hand that stopped it from creeping in from a flying Diaz on that far post. Liverpool pressing, corner kick, far side, the right, Canate with a header six yards out, couldn't keep it down. Yeah, he should have scored, free header, great ball in from McAllister, gets a run on the near post almost at the corner of the six-yard box and uh, heads it over the bar. But now we're seeing Liverpool burn their teeth a little bit. They've been a bit sort of sleepy in the first sort of half an hour, but now they're sort of turning the speed up a little bit and it's all come from Robertson. He's been a real driving force. There's been a goal in extra time. Tottenham-Leicester, Flo Pollock. Tottenham one, Tottenham two, sorry, Leicester one. Martha Thomas with a looping header. Surely Tottenham are heading to Wembley now. Four minutes left. Tottenham 2, Leicester 1. Thank you, Flo. Earlier, Ross County 3, Rangers 2. It's a struggling Ross County getting a, a valuable three points. Real dent in Rangers' title aspirations. Arsenal, Aston Villa commentary to come at 4.30. Then it'll be 6.06. And from 8 o'clock tonight, the US Masters, the final round from Augusta, Mark Chapman, Ian Carter and co. Uh, Scotty Scheffler, the overnight leader with, I think, a one-shot lead. 8 p.m. tonight on BBC Radio 5 Live. Meanwhile, Elise running forward from Ezra. Back heel from Mateta. Flags up, wouldn't have counted yeah. anyway. Mind you, I'm surprised he went with a fancy flick rather than just guiding it in first time. But he had it so sloppy from Liverpool again. Canati plays the ball in the end, though. It's a sloppy pass. He gets sort of robbed by Wharton and then Palace are at them. They're breaking four against three. It slipped out there. I think it was Mitchell. Good cross in. No, it says he crosses it. Good ball in. Mateta's always in the offside position. Should have held his run. That's three great opportunities they've had already. Here is uh, McAllister. McAllister forward. Goes down just outside the area. Oh, wow. And the referee has given a direct free kick inside the D, just outside the box, Chris Kavner. And this won't be very good for Dean Henderson. It's so central. Whoever takes it, they could go either side. Just looking at it again. I wasn't sure whether it was... Yeah, there's contact there from Lerma. It is a free kick. Uh, good decision, ref. But yeah, you're right. These are funny ones, but they're so close in, Ian. Yeah. Sometimes I, was, I think you might have to move it to one side to get a, you know, a shot off. It's really hard to get this up and over. So you're literally, for the people listening in, you're like 19 yards right in line with the centre spot, central. There's no angle for you at the minute, you know, so it's going to be interesting to see what they do here. That's Neil Lennon, the former Northern Ireland international, who's with us here. 13 minutes to go to half-time for what has been a, a very good game of football, very entertaining. And Crystal Palace lead by a goal to nil here at Anfield. And you have got, well, one of four who are hovering near the ball. Salah, McAllister, Nunez, 
Robertson just on the periphery. I don't think he's going to take it, so we're left with Nunez, McAllister and Salah as a likely taker. Meanwhile, Crystal Palace in their white shirts with the sky blue sash going down the front. They've got, I think, Nathaniel Klein in the draft excluder role standing behind what must be five in the wall there. You've got another three just to the left as we look. Henderson not going to be very well sighted at all with this because two Liverpool players have also now stood in front of a couple of Crystal Palace players. It's either going to be McAllister or Salah. Liverpool trailing. It's going to be McAllister into the wall that broke very quickly. It's blocked by Ezzet. Comes out towards Van Dijk, midway through the Palace half. Out towards Jones. Jones doesn't keep the ball in play. Tried to let it run. Drop his shoulder away from Elise and didn't realise that he was going to run out of uh, playing surface. And so with 12 minutes to go to half-time, Liverpool still trail. Yeah, I think they did the right thing by moving it, just not quick enough, getting the shot off and a good block by Elise. So it's finally poised, you know, I mean, Palace have been good volley for the lead, they've created some great clear-cut chances. Liverpool or Liverpool, you know, they're not at their best at the minute, but we know how dangerous they can be. And the worry for Liverpool is that Crystal Palace have shown enough quality that on the counter-attack they are more than capable of increasing their lead. They've uh, had it not been for that terrific bit of defending from Robertson, they would have been leading 2-0. They've had a, another chance since that uh, Mateta just straight into an offside position as McAllister tries to release Salah. Salah looking to get away from Lerma. Lerma, though, back goal side. Salah into the penalty area, pushed away by Henderson off the left foot of uh, Salah. And now Elise picks it up inside his own half, goes infield to Hughes. Hughes showed too much to McAllister, been dispossessed. McAllister... Loses out to Wharton, Robertson tries to win it back, Endo, Wharton battling for it in the midfield, Crystal Palace players doing well, and now it's with Mateta, and he's got Munoz going on ahead of him on this near side, the right strikes his heels, and Munoz tooks it back to, uh, to Elise, Mateta battling for it, it's a really good contest in the midfield. Robertson looks for the run of Nunez. Anderson will go with him. Henderson comes out and volleys the ball out for a Liverpool throw. There's been a goal in the women's other FA Cup semi-final. Manchester United, Chelsea, Sané, Rodra, Vagela. And as United had taken the lead inside a minute, it was a mishit back pass by Perisette, the right back for Chelsea. United came down the left-hand side with Galton. She crossed for Lucia Garcia to fire home. We're 1-0 to Manchester United after two minutes. Which are Manchester United won, Chelsea nil. Incidentally, that's live on BBC One. Uh, match the day two tonight, BBC One at 10.30, Alan Shearer and Shea Given are doing all the analysis and certainly I'm sure they'll be enjoying this game because from a neutral it's been an absorbing watch. Ten minutes to go to half-time, Liverpool nil, Crystal Palace one. Robertson waits, stationary, left-hand side, Endo. Back to Van Dijk, ten yards forward into the Crystal Palace half. Endo gives it back to the uh, to the Dutchman. He's got such a proud record. His only loss in 97 Premier League home games was that one against Leeds United. They'll be hoping that they can still salvage it here against this excellent Crystal Palace side who are alert and ambitious. They've certainly shown plenty of adventure. So they come forward again with Eze. They've got Elise making the run into the penalty area. It was just a heavy right-footed touch that had presented it to Allison. Because otherwise, they could have been in again. Ian, they can't keep giving the ball away, Liverpool, in those central areas. This time it was in, though. And they, Crystal Palace are cutting through them with the brilliance of Eze, the brilliance of Matete, and the brilliance of Elise. They look such a threat on the counter-attack. They're set up beautifully. They're nicking the ball in central areas, and they're killing Liverpool on the counter. And they're lucky, Liverpool, at the minute, that it's not more than two, uh, one. If you're hearing... Uh a bit of ringing in your ears, it's not tinnitus, it's the alarm bells that keep ringing from Crystal Palace because there have been so many <laughs> warning signs, hasn't there, from this Crystal Palace side. Every time and time again. Tottenham against Leicester City, it's now finished. Flo Pollock. Full time in the Women's FA Cup semi-final, Tottenham 2, Leicester 1. Tottenham women are going to Wembley for the first time in their history. They came from behind today to win an extra time. Tottenham are into the FA Cup final. Full time, Tottenham 2, Leicester 1. Van Dijk. Out it goes to uh, to Bradley. Header forward, though, on that far side. Ezra plays it back. Little touch by Hughes didn't quite come off. Here is uh, Endo. Endo to Jones. Back pedals, tries to give himself a little bit more space. Out then on this near side. Robertson lifts the ball in field, just outside the centre circle. Van Dijk 
towards McAllister, back with Van Dijk, Crystal Palace have got everybody back behind the ball, we've got eight minutes to go to half-time here on BBC Radio 5 Live, and Liverpool still trail. Crystal Palace have been well worth the lead, McAllister, Nunez, with a little flick, didn't quite come off. By the way, from somebody who suffers with tinnitus, I wasn't making light of that condition. Oh, do you? <laughs> yeah, it's a nightmare. <laughs> I've got a lot of problems with my ears. Pardon? <laughs> <laughs> Header away. <laughs> Walked into that one. <laughs> Henderson waits. All in green, away towards our left-hand side. Clears it quite high. It's going to drop, actually, and invitingly for McAllister to head it forward. Hughes then plays it back. It'll be some team talk the way it stands for Jurgen Klopp, isn't it? I think he may have to make changes. There's definitely a problem earlier between Canati and Bradley when Bradley goes so high. You know, and if they don't get the pass right, Palace are breaking through Yezzy down the left-hand side at will. And it, the midfield's a little bit, for me, seamy-seamy. You know, one-paced, nice passers. There's no dynamism come from the midfield. And they're not getting the ball quick enough into those... You know, front three who can be devastating. We saw a cameo of Salah earlier on, a long ball over the top where no matter how good a defender you are, sometimes you just can't stop. But he steps inside, gets a shot off. But it's been few and far between you in this first half. The thing is, though, realistically, Liverpool need two goals. A draw is not yeah, good enough absolutely. for Liverpool. And it's really hard. You've talked about the amount of times they go behind. It's a big effort to claw that back each and every time. And um, they're going to have to do it the next... 50, 60 minutes. Offside against Ezra, that'll be a free kick to Liverpool. Liverpool have taken 32 points out of 39 since Christmas. Manchester City, 39 from 45. Arsenal, 32 from 42. For any of the three title-chasing sides, realistically, with the quality that the, the three have got, they've got to win every single game. Bradley turns... Holds off Mitchell, runs forward, Connor Bradley into the penalty area. Anderson again there. Anderson has been so alert throughout, clears it into the bottom tier. This is a Kenny Dalglish stand on that far side. Liverpool have a throw, five minutes to go to half time. I mean, can you just say, you know, we've got to give Palace an enormous amount of credit for their one, the set up, and two, their attitude to this game. They're playing with um, the two outside centre halves to Anderson. One's a midfield player yeah. and one's a right back end. Yeah. You know, and to prefer Henderson's had one, one really good save to make so far. Here is uh, Canate. Back with uh, Van Dyke. Left of the centre circle. Anfield falls silent. Canate to Endo. Full backs are pushed on. One of them is Bradley, far side the right. His forward ball to Salah. Easily dealt with by Mitchell. Now up to Eze. Loses out. Liverpool with that cluster of red shirts. Salah right-hand side. Lerma was alert. Stepped forward. Ball played forward. Was a little bit too eager by Jones. Cleared by the Crystal Palace defence only as far as Allison. You can hear the frustration in the Anfield crowd. Desperate for Liverpool to get back onto level terms. Crystal Palace, though, with Van Dijk retreat. Robertson hits a hopeful ball forward towards Luis Diaz, cleared by Klein. Jones tries to help it back, and it will run out of play, and it will be. The Crystal Palace throw on this near side, four minutes to go to half-time. They had that little flurry just short of the half-hour mark, didn't they? Yep. Endo hit the crossbar, uh, Diaz forced a save out of Henderson, and then we've just had a little bit of a, a, a lull since. Yeah, although Palace did have that counter-attack when Mateta was offside. But again, Ian, they're playing through the midfield far too easily. You know, they're not getting close enough, Liverpool, in midfield. The gaps are too big. And Hughes and Morton and Elise and uh, Eze are having a great time. There's another shot. Elise with a shot, laid off to him by Mateta. It was straight at Alisson. Van Dijk's, Van Dijk's starting to, you know, get off the people. He has to do that. He's the captain. I've been disappointed with him. First half has been... I know Virgil very, very well. He needs to do more for the team here because you can tell they're struggling a little bit and that's where your big players need to step up now. Just over three minutes of normal time remains. McAllister, ball over the top. Nunez gives chase. Henderson hesitates. He crosses. It comes to Luis Diaz. The angle is tight. Can't get it goalwards. Dug out by Munoz. Flag was up on the far side anyway. It wouldn't have counted. 
that the hesitation from Henderson just allowed Liverpool that glimpse of goal. Yeah, I thought he was offside, but I'll also have to look at my goalkeeper. You know, he's yeah, he's he's just slightly offside. But that's Henderson's ball all day long. I don't know where he stopped. He should just come out and clean that up. It was a decent lane from Paulus to before. He made an error here uh, when he was on loan at Sheffield United, failed to hold a Genie Vidaldum shot. Did uh, did Dean Henderson getting a, a run now in the Crystal Palace first team with that elbow injury to uh, to Sam Johnston, who's going to be out for the rest of the season. As McAllister, referee, that was strange from Chris Kavanagh, sees the free kick, McAllister is being held, Endo brings the ball clear, let the game flow, where was the advantage for Liverpool? Yeah, none whatsoever, it was a poor decision from the ref. Fans are letting them know in. <laughs> Two minutes to go to half-time. Here is uh, McAllister. Crystal Palace again have got the white shirts back behind the ball. Here is uh, Endo now. Jones in the centre circle, but you've got in front of him, you had Hughes, Wharton, Elise. Jones is being tracked there by Wharton, putting him under pressure, passes the ball to Canate. Wharton now retreats, Canate with a diagonal ball, finds Endo on the half turn, out then to Robertson on this near side, the left. Infield back towards Endo. Laps of concentration, loses the ball, goes underneath his right boot, tries to win it back, Mateta shrugs him away as Klein passes the ball out to Elise on this near side, the Crystal Palace left, midway through their own half. His forward ball goes straight to Jones, runs away from Munoz, to McAllister, McAllister to Canate. Munoz, though, continues to oh. track the ball, and there is a turnover, and Munoz with his hard work and his tenacity has paid off for Crystal Palace, and Eze and Elise running through, and they've got a man over him, Mateta, if Elise can get his head up, Elise in towards the penalty area, goes for goal. Left foot is shot, blocked by the legs of Van Dijk, and there was another warning sign for Liverpool. Crystal Palace couldn't take advantage. They've had enough chances. Ian, Liverpool have been so sloppy. They've turned the ball over in so many bad areas, and Palace are just setting the traps and waiting to pounce. You know, and a better ball into Elise, and he'd have been clean through there. It was just too far ahead of him. Here they come again. Here is Ezra. As a left-hand side with a cross, Mateta darting header at the near side of the six-yard box, saying he was being pushed. His head is off target. Crystal Palace playing very, very well, leading by a goal to nil. A oh, beautiful dummy from Eze. He has been magnificent first half. And a beautiful little ball the outside of his foot. I'm not sure there's a push there. It's, um, he's outside the near post. It's a really difficult angle for him to score the header. There's no foul there. But again, great play from Eze. Canate forward ball. We're going to have two minutes of added on time, which we'll be into in about 30 seconds. Mateta holds the ball up for Crystal Palace inside breaks it down as there was a breakdown in communication between Elise and Eze, and now Robertson on this near side, the left for Liverpool. Robertson, forward ball, Luis Diaz trying to back into a Klein. Wharton throws himself into the challenge. Diaz has done well as he spins free. Nutmegs Mateta for good effect. Now with McAllister into stoppage time we go. McAllister's ball is behind Connor Bradley. And the crowd now just starting to get on the players' backs here at Anfield. You can feel the frustration. But again, for me, I think Bradley's too far ahead of the ball for McAllister to make that pass. If he just holds his run, then he can slip with them square and he can drive forward. It's just obviously it's something that they talk about in training. You know, Connor takes up these really wide and high positions, but just the Palace have capitalised that area so many times in the first half on the counter. Ball hit forward by Hughes. What a 45 minutes lie ahead in the second half for Liverpool and their title challenge as uh, Elise helps win the ball back for Crystal Palace. Ezra is behind him, we're in stoppage time. Sun shining once again here at Anfield. Certainly not shining on Liverpool's chances as the ball is a rather hopeful one forward. Henderson running back, gathers it in before Nunez inside his penalty area to the acclaim of the Crystal Palace travelling support. 1-0 to Crystal Palace. Stoppage time here at Anfield on BBC Radio 5 Live. Arsenal, Aston Villa to come at 4.30. Henderson, he was guilty of uh, time-wasting in a recent game at Nottingham Forest. Crowd on his back there, eventually he clears it away downfield. Lerma heads it away, helped further clear by Mitchell. Out of play, it goes for a throw. Over the course of the 45 minutes, Liverpool probably haven't done enough in this first half. No, Fallas have been played the better football, created the better chances, have been the more disciplined, have kept the ball better at times, Ian. I've never seen Liverpool give the ball away so much, and 
like I said to you earlier, you know, the midfield for me looks too one paced. Very similar players in Jones, McAllister, and Endo. I think Endo struggled. I think um, Wharton and Hughes have done a very good job, but they've had plenty of space to play in, particularly on the counter. And the two way, well, the front three of Palace have been a real handful first half. There is the half time whistle, and it is a deserve lead for Crystal Palace here at Anfield. Liverpool nil, Crystal Palace one. Crystal Palace taking the lead through Eze unmarked seven yards out from Mitchell's cross from the left after 14 minutes, three minutes later, had it not been for the brilliance of Andy Robertson from Mateta's goal-bound effort with a terrific goal-line clearance, it would have actually been increased. Liverpool, with Endo hitting the crossbar and Henderson saving from Diaz, haven't done enough and there is work to do for Liverpool. Liverpool nil, Crystal Palace won. Ian, thank you. Um, what a story unfolding then at Anfield. Neil Lennon, I mean, it's pretty much what we said before the game kicked off. Liverpool can't keep clean sheets. They've conceded another goal today. And they've had lots of promising positions and haven't been able to capitalise on any of them. Fletcher has been poor. They've given the ball away far too easily. They've given the ball away in bad areas. They started off really sloppily. I mean, they got a warning sign early on when Mitchell put a cross in almost in the first minute. And Alisson came and punched it away. And that was the, that set the tone for the first half. There's not been a, a huge reaction. The one player who's been a real driving force for Liverpool has been Robertson. But you've got to give uh, Palace a lot of credit. They've looked a really good side. And with Eze and Elise in the team, particularly down that left-hand side, Eze has plundered Liverpool. You know, the gap between Canati and, and Bradley at times has been a chasm, and he is really enjoying himself out there. But they've got to, you know, get more snap into their passes and certainly work the back three a lot more because they've... Through the midfield, through the lanes, they've been very poor. I'm pinching Ian's statistic before the game, but it's relevant now. I think he said that Crystal Palace had taken the lead or scored the first goal in five of their last six matches. The issue they've had under Oliver Glasner is holding on to the lead, and that is the challenge that they're faced with now in the second half at Anfield. Yeah, look, look Fletch, there could easily have been two or three up here. I know Liverpool hit the bar and they had one decent chance from Diaz, but the clear-cut chances have all come from... Uh, counter-attacks from Palace and Mateta really when he was 1v1 should have scored he shouldn't have allowed or Robertson shouldn't have had the chance to get back but you got to say it was brilliant work from Robertson and we could easily be looking at 2-0 here they've been flat Liverpool he needs to get some dynamism into the midfield and play the ball a lot quicker because it's been far too slow Neil thank you big second half to come then for Liverpool at Anfield Crystal Palace leading to Eze's goal uh, is this going to be uh, one of these big twists in a title race. Three teams fighting Manchester City top, Liverpool with a chance to go past them, but they've got to find goals in the second half at Anfield. It's half-time at the London Stadium as well. Fulham leading there, Sahail Sahi. Yes, they are, Darren. West Ham nil, Fulham won. Anders Pereira, the star performer for the visitors, he's got the goal and he could have had a further two. West Brom, they started the brighter with a golden chance for Mikel Antonio. And then after nine minutes, Mavra Panos, the West Ham centre-half, he made a mistake inside his own penalty area, which Pereira pounced on and smashed in for the goal. Since the goal, Fulham have been on top with Pereira and Paulinia both having moments to extend the lead. West Ham second best so far. Half-time here, Darren. West Ham nil, Fulham one. Thank you, Sahel. Second half commentary on five sports extra for that one. So Liverpool nil, Crystal Palace one, West Ham nil. Fulham won the half-time scores in the early games in the Premier League. Half past four will bring you full commentary of Arsenal versus Aston Villa from the Emirates. We'll also get reaction from Ross County. They beat Rangers in the Scottish Premiership and head to the Emirates for the first time today. But first, let's get the latest BBC News with James Wickham. Listen on BBC Sounds. This is BBC Radio 5 Live. Thanks, Darren. Good afternoon. Israel says its confrontation with Iran is not over after Tehran fired more than 300 drones and missiles at it overnight. The Israeli Defence Minister says despite 99% of those being shot down, the country must be prepared for every scenario. Iran has warned of a much bigger response if Israel retaliates and has told the US it will attack American bases if Washington helps the Israelis hit back. The US says it does not want to see the situation escalate. Here, the Prime Minister Rishi Sunak has confirmed that RAF planes shot down a number of the Iranian drones. G7 leaders are holding urgent talks. Here's our political correspondent Pete Saul. 
The Prime Minister's key message, though, de-escalate. He'll be involved in this meeting of G7 leaders later on this afternoon, and the emphasis on that will be very much on how we draw a line under what has just happened without having to talk about any further military intervention. The UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres has condemned the attack, saying he was deeply alarmed about the very real danger of a devastating escalation. The Security Council will hold an emergency meeting later, and both Saudi Arabia and China have appealed for calm. We'll have updates here on Five Live through the afternoon and a new special with Johnny Ianson from 7:30 p.m. this evening. In other news, legal teams representing more than 250 survivors of the Manchester Arena bombing say they're suing MI5. An inquiry into the 2017 terror attack found it may have been prevented if the agency acted on the intelligence it had about the bomber. And a vigil has been taking place near a shopping centre in Sydney, where six people were killed on Saturday in a knife attack. Twelve others, including a baby, were wounded when a man began stabbing shoppers before being shot dead by police. Let's take a journey back to 2003. Canadian sensation Avril Lavigne was turning the music industry upside down. But what if I told you that the Avril Lavigne we know and love might not be the same Avril? What? I'm Joanne McNally and I'm doing a deep dive into a notorious internet conspiracy. Who replaced Avril Lavigne? Listen on BBC Sounds. This is Five Live Sports with Darren Fletcher on Five Live. Listen on BBC Sounds. So the second half to come from Anfield shortly. Liverpool trailing Crystal Palace by a goal to nil. And over on Sports Extra, you can hear West Ham against Fulham. Halftime in the London derby. Fulham leading that one by one goal to nil. So earlier today, Tottenham made it through to their first Women's FA Cup final. They needed extra time to see off Leicester 2-1. Here's Martha Thomas, who scored the winner. I'm over the moon for, for the team. We, uh, we dug really deep. This is something that we've wanted and I'm just so chuffed that we got over the line. What was going through your head when you saw that ball swung into the area? Uh, at first I thought Luana was going to head it um, and she did, but she flicked it on and then I just thought you've got to get in front of this defender. Um, I didn't want penalties, so yeah, I'm just, I'm just so happy for us. We dug deep and came from behind again and won. Sum this up for the team, because Tottenham Hotspur are going to an FA Cup final for the first time. It's huge. Um, a, a lot of words, but we're such a tight-knit group that work hard for each other, and I'm just so chuffed for all of us. Betty Glover with the questions there. And Spurs will face either Chelsea or Manchester United in the final. Sani Rudravadula is watching this one at the Lee Sports Village. Well, 22 minutes have elapsed since Manchester United won Chelsea. Nearly took the lead inside that first minute. It was a good cross from Leah Galton. Uh, finished first time by Lucia Garcia, but it came from a mistake at the back by Eve Perisette trying to play the ball back to Hannah Hampton and a weak clearance. United so far have actually matched Chelsea despite the big chasm between them in the league. It's a good 14 points between them. United, though, proving to be a good competition for the holders. It's Manchester United 1, Chelsea 0. Now, there was a big result and a big shock at the top of the Scottish Premiership where Ross County claimed their first ever victory over Rangers, beating them by three goals to two. The result means that Celtic remain four points clear at the top, but Rangers do have a game in hand. Let's hear from Ross County's interim manager, Don Cowie. Well, I'm delighted for the, the whole football club, you know, it was built upon a very good team performance today. You know, people will get the headlines individually, but I thought collectively as a as a team we were excellent. Uh, first half, I thought we maybe deserved a bit more out of it in terms of what we put in. The message at half time was, you know, to keep that going and build on it and be positive. And you know, we started the second half excellently, and then you get a bit nervous, you know, at the end of the game. But just delighted for everyone. It's a big three points for us. So Celtic remain four points clear at the top. Rangers have a game in hand. There's still a game to play um, in the Scottish Premiership at Celtic Park between those two clubs between now and the end of the season. In rugby, there's Champions Cup quarter-final action, which is just about to get underway between Toulouse and Exeter. Adam Whitty's watching this one. 
Yeah, and whoever wins today will face Harlequins for a place in the final. Exeter could make it three English teams out of four in the last four should they win. Northampton and Quinns already having booked their place. Exeter unchanged from the quarter-final win at Bath. International Slade, Faye Waboso, Jenkins uh, and uh, many more among and Roots rather among the starting 15. But they're yet to win away in any competition this year. So can they get past the five-time European champions to lose? Stacked full of world-class talent, including superstar halfback pairing Roman Untermach and Antoine Dupont. If they do, they will probably have achieved the toughest task in European club rugby. Kick-off just a few minutes away. Adam, thank you. The women's Six Nations, France have beaten Italy by 38 points to 15. And in the second women's FA Cup semi-final, the deadlock's been broken. Sammy. Uh, well, yes, a second goal now for Manchester United. Just after you came to me, a lovely cross from Ella Toon from the left-hand side. And 36-year-old Rachel Williams was there to head home. She won the FA Cup back in 2012 with Birmingham City. She might have another chance at the moment. It's Manchester United 2, Chelsea 0. So Manchester United on course, Tottenham Hotspur already there. Now from 8 o'clock tonight, Mark Chapman and the Five Live golf team will be live from Augusta National for the conclusion of this year's Masters. World number one, Scotty Scheffler leads going into the final round. He's seven under par, one shot clear of the field, and we can hear from the leader on how he's preparing for the final round. Managing my energy, managing my expectations. Um, you know, I've, I've talked about it a little bit, but I, I do have high expectations for myself, and um, I try to do my best to get that stuff out of the way in the morning. And by the time I get to the course, it's kind of getting into my own little world and just trying to hit shots. Um, you know, being patient out there, I think, is really important. Um, I think I, I try to feed off the energy from the crowd a little bit. It's nice walking onto these tee boxes and getting a nice ovation. It's it's a really nice feeling to have the crowd behind you, and uh, I try to embrace that as much as possible out there. So that's uh, Scotty Sheffler. You can listen to the final round on Five Live from 8 o'clock tonight with a whole Five Live golf team and see whether he can get a second green jacket or whether somebody can come from behind and pip him to it. So 4.30 will be at the Emirates today for Arsenal against Aston Villa. We can say good afternoon for the first time this afternoon to Chris Wise. Chris, how much are you looking forward to this one? Hello, Fletch. Yeah, very much so. You find me at the moment, I'm just down uh, by the tunnel here at the Emirates Stadium, but there is such a sense of anticipation. I arrived about three hours before kickoff, and already, even then, outside the stadium, there were thousands of people milling around. There's a real sense of occasion here, because Arsenal, of course, know that with every weekend that passes and with every win that they tick off, and how many of those have they got already in 2024, they are going that little bit closer to getting that first Premier League title in 20 years. So there's an awful lot of excitement building here. It's going to be interesting, Chris, what Mikel Arteta does because he's faced with this dilemma of he knows he's probably got to win every game because he's expecting Manchester City to do that. But he's also aware that he's got Bayern Munich to come in the Champions League on Wednesday. I think that the team that he picks is going to be fascinating. It is. I mean, for me, really... Fletch, there's, there's two positions that are up for grabs in this Arsenal team at the moment, and that's left-back, and I'd imagine that Alexander Zinchenko will go back in there this afternoon. We saw Jakob Kivior, of course, play there against Bayern Munich during the week, but he was taken off at half-time and perhaps didn't have the greatest 45 minutes. And then, obviously, on that left-attacking part of that Arsenal front three, Gabriel Martinelli, you imagine, would get the nod, but does he bring Gabriel Jesus in today just to freshen things up a little bit? So he does have a couple of choices, Mikel Arteta. Whether he moves anyone else around within his 11, I'm not too sure he will, because, frankly, as important as that Champions League game is to them out in Munich on Wednesday night, this this today is is imperative, really, for Arsenal, and they're going to have to show that they're capable on, on fighting on two fronts between now and the end of the season if they're going to go all the way and take that Premier League title that they crave so much. Yeah, two sides to every story, of course. No Douglas Luiz today. He's suspended for Aston Villa. But the way it looks for the race for the top four. I mean, if they could get anything today, that's going to be significant for them from a Villa standpoint. Massive, absolutely huge, especially off the back of what happened to Tottenham yesterday um, because that, that mauling at Newcastle United, I imagine Aston Villa probably didn't expect that to happen, if truth be told. So suddenly the dial has moved back in their direction. They, ha they haven't even played Aston Villa so far this weekend and they've gone from fifth into fourth. So what an opportunity for them to double down on that, that position here. But the, the really interesting dynamic for me, Darren, about this game 
in terms of from an Aston Villa perspective is that Arsenal have had an extra 48 hours to prepare for this game. They played on Tuesday. Villa played in Europe on Thursday and had that taxing game against Lille as well, where they were worked particularly hard. Plus, with the injuries that Unai Emery is dealing with at the moment, and as you say, no Douglas Luiz today because of suspension as well. So, what will this Villa team look like, and how much battery life will there be in the legs when we get underway at 4:30? Chris, looking forward to it. So that's to come at half past four. Chris Wise alongside Danny Gabadon. Now, don't forget West Ham Fulham is on Five Sports Extra. One nil to Fulham in the London derby at the London Stadium. Let's head back to Anfield where it's a big 45 minutes coming up here for Liverpool, Ian Dennis. I've just seen the goal back again from various angles. I actually wonder whether any player's been that free to score a goal against Liverpool on that pitch all season. He just lost you there towards the end, Darren, because it coincided with the team coming out. I was just making the point, I mean, seeing the goal from various angles, I actually wonder whether any player has been that free to score a goal on that pitch against Liverpool all season. There wasn't a red shirt anywhere near, Ezra. No, no, from the cross from, uh, from Mitchell, he was given so much space. It was like he was taking a walk across Stanley Park, wasn't it, with the amount of room that he had either side of him. Canate didn't pick him up, Van Dijk didn't pick him up. Uh, Liverpool, though, have responded with making a change at half-time. Dominic Sabosli has come on and he has replaced Endo. Crystal Palace, well worth their lead. White shirts, sky blue shorts, uh, haven't made a change. We are back underway. BBC Radio 5 Live and BBC Sounds. Alisson in goal. Back four of Bradley, Van Dijk, Canate and Robertson for Liverpool. McAllister, Sabosli and Jones in the midfield. Salah, Nunez and Diaz are the front three. Liverpool all in red, playing from left to right, attacking the cop end against a Crystal Palace side in their white shirts and sky blue shorts that have Henderson in goal, a back three of Klein, Anderson and Lerma. Munoz and Mitchell are the wing-backs right and left, respectively. Hughes, Wharton, Eza, Elise and Mateta. The referee is Chris Kavanagh. And I would sense that, Neil Lennon, you're not surprised that Endo has made way for Sabosli. No, he had to make a change. There were two one pierce in midfield. Suppose they will give them energy and dynamism, but there's a, a worry here at the minute, Ian. Connor Bradley going to the challenge with Ezzy, and he's come out worse. Trent Alexander-Arnold is amongst the substitutes. Bradley getting tended to for Liverpool. When you think back that during Covid times, they suffered, I think it was six successive defeats here at Anfield, but in front of supporters, Liverpool's record, they've lost just one of their last 113 home league games in front of fans at Anfield. That was against Leeds United. Listen, don't talk to me about COVID. I went through the same thing at Celtic that season. As soon as the fans came back, Celtic were back to the best on the range. So I know exactly what Jurgen was going through without the, without the fans. They're not the same club, they're not the same team. It's the same with big clubs like Celtic and your traditional big clubs. But they're not going to take any risks with Conor Bradley. Uh, Trent Alexander-Arnold is going to be coming on. So, although they made that half-time change, this will be the first of three opportunities to make alterations in the second half. And Trent Alexander-Arnold, who's been back in training this week, he was an unused substitute against Atalanta on Thursday. He's missed 12 games with a, a knee injury. The England international is going to be coming on. And Connor Bradley, who's uh, done well as he's deputised, the uh, Northern Ireland international, is going to make way for Alexander Arnold. So there is an early stoppage to the second half here at Anfield, where Liverpool trail Crystal Palace by a goal to nil, and Connor Bradley is being helped off the pitch. Yeah, he's a super young player, super talent, not only for Liverpool but for Northern Ireland. He scored the winner last month against Scotland. Uh, it's really sad to see him go off. He just seemed to go over on his ankle. It could be a bit of ligament damage. And it must be bad for him to go off because he's not he's a hardy boy, you know. This is exactly what Liverpool didn't want either. Not just the, the change in, but just the loss of momentum already. Well, there's a big hug for Trent Alexander-Arnold, and then there's a huge roar. The hug came from Jurgen Klopp. The roar came from the Anfield crowd as he takes to the field and Liverpool three minutes into the second half are forced to make an, another substitution as they still trail by a goal to nil in a game realistically that they have to win. Crystal Palace created a number of chances in that first half. They're leading by a goal to nil. 
a Crystal Palace team that inflicted the first ever defeat when Jurgen Klopp was Liverpool manager. It was his seventh game in charge. They won by two goals to one back in 2015. As the ball is hit, hopefully, downfield by Canate and claimed by Henderson. It's going to be fascinating watching Alexander Arnold. You know, he's been out for a while, in and out, you know, for a while, but um, you know, if he does go wandering, you know, Ezzy could take full advantage of that as well. But uh, when he's on the ball, he needs a super player, as we know. Henderson holding on to the ball, flat clearance. Straight it goes to McAllister. Sabosli, the substitute to Alexander Arnold. Salah under pressure, didn't keep the ball in play. It'll be a Crystal Palace throw. I mean, you mentioned it, well, we both mentioned it in the first half, you know, this unusual looking back three. But Lerma for a midfielder, he has done exceptionally well today. Ian, he's been outstanding. He's been so aggressive in the tackle. He's read the game brilliantly, he's covered the ground well. And it looks like he's played there all his career. He's been brilliant first half, really aggressive in the challenge and really good on the ball, obviously, because he's a midfield player. But it just shows the flexibility of these kind of players, you know, they can slot into different positions and make it look comfortable. Crystal Palace without a win in 10 away games in the Premier League since Burnley in early November. Still lead by a goal to nil. Five minutes into the second half, Anderson hoists it out towards the far side, headed on by Munoz. Canate to Van Dijk, early forward ball to McAllister midway through his own half, out towards Robertson, far side the left, Nunez makes the run, Anderson though again is there to head it out of play, Jones wants to take it quickly on that far side the left. After this game, our attentions will turn to Arsenal against Aston Villa, commentary of that from 4.30 at the Emirates. Liverpool at the moment not taking the opportunity to go to the top of the table. Arsenal might, Manchester City yesterday beating Luton Town, boosting their goal difference. Talked about goal difference earlier on in the programme. Today for Liverpool, it's all about securing the three points. Mitchell lets it run out of play, marshals it safely out for a throw. Can't fault Crystal Palace, really, can you? you just look a really good side, competent. Just wonder how much the first half might have taken out of them. We'll see as we go along in the second half. But, yeah, they look comfortable at the minute. I haven't seen Liverpool give the ball away as much under no pressure in for a long, long time. I don't know if it's a psychological thing or fatigue from Thursday night, but they've got to shake it off now. You know, they've got, well, 45, 50 minutes to win this game and keep themselves in the title hunt. Well, Liverpool, who've won the most points from losing positions in the Premier League against the Crystal Palace side that have lost the most points from winning positions with 23. Here is McAllister on the halfway line, left of the centre circle, seven minutes into the second half here on Five Live. Stroked in field by Jones to Van Dijk, closed by Mateta. Canate, pressed then from Eze, blocked by Hughes. Header from Mateta goes straight to Sabosla, who gives it away. Neil Lennon just talking about Liverpool being sloppy, and now Hughes can come forward and he chips the ball into the path of Eze. Eze with a first-time cross, Elise had made the run, it's going to be kept alive by Munoz, far side the right. Munoz beats his man, pulls it back, Elise, there's a man over, it's Wharton, plays finished, blocked by his own player. Mateta goes there into the challenge with Sabosli. The referee gives the free kick in favour of Liverpool inside their own penalty area. So lucky. Liverpool are so lucky still be in this game. That's uh, Alexander Arnold give the ball away, then Sabosli give the ball away and Palace almost punished them. Now it's with Robertson, Robertson darting in towards the penalty area, then he slips, taken over by Nunez, and Nunez, the angle was extremely tight, and it goes out of play for a goal kick. Champions Cup quarter-final, Toulouse, Exeter, latest from Adam Whitty. Toulouse 7, Exeter 3, Toulouse have stifled a promising Exeter start, Henry Slade's early penalty cancelled out by a gorgeous move, finished off by France fly half, Roman Untermach under the post. Toulouse 7, Exeter 3, 10 minutes gone. Manchester United's women lead Chelsea in the second FA Cup semi-final by two goals to nil, live on BBC One. The right to play Tottenham, who beat Leicester City 2-1 after extra time. In the Scottish Premiership, Celtic still have a four-point lead over Rangers after Ross County beat second-place Rangers 3-2 earlier. West Ham nil, Fulham 1 in the other game in the Premier League at 2. That's on Sports Extra. We've got the final round of the US Masters from Augusta on BBC Radio 5 Live from 8 o'clock tonight. But this is the Premier League. BBC Sounds and 5 Live Sport, eight minutes into the second half, where Liverpool still trail. 
by that Eberica as a goal after 14 minutes. Bizarrely, Crystal Palace have won more games in the Premier League at Anfield than they actually have at Selhurst Park. And they're looking for a fourth success here at this ground. Alexander-Arnold, diagonal ball, inside, Saboslai to Salah. Salah with Lerma, gets a throw. Back it goes to McAllister, Alexander-Arnold to Canate. On the halfway line now to Van Dijk. Runs forward, left of the centre circle, out towards Robertson, central area, just in from the left touch line. Van Dijk finds McAllister centrally. Hughes goes to close him down. Canate passes the ball forward. Jones now to Nunez. Nunez with the turn, holds onto the ball, works it onto his right foot, back seals it to Salah. Salah with the cross. Jones was there, challenged by Nunez. Goes out for a corner kick. Corner kick to Liverpool, still trailing. Do you know what? The, any time they've had good build-up, it's when Canati's played it into the, the forward area. There's a great ball into, I think it was Nunez, or Diaz, Diaz the Nunez, Nunez little back heel to Salah, good ball in. Brilliant defending from Nunez, I have to say. You know, that, that was a goal. You know, Curtis Jones just about to open his body up. Nunez uh, gets a touch on it. Corner kick, downward header, Nunez! Saved by Henderson by his legs from close range. And then the header from Wharton goes out of play. From the downward header, it was hit straight at the keeper, and Henderson denies it. Ian, he's got the score. He's got the whole goal. He's just hit it straight at Henderson. Brilliant reactions from Henderson, but wow, what a, that's the biggest chance of the day by anyone. He's six yards out, the ball's bounced up lovely for him, and he's hit it straight at the goalkeeper. Great save from Henderson, but should have been a goal. So boss line with a corner on this right-hand side, flying header by Lerma at the near side of the six-yard box, went across the face of goal, glanced off his head, Salah sends over the cross from the left, so boss line tries to lay it off first time, doesn't control it, Crystal Palace are able to break, they're always a threat on the counter-attack, Nunez stops Eze, so boss line tidies up, McAllister now comes forward, it's done by the cop, Nunez now right corner of the area, Nunez with the cross, Salah's heavy touch directs the ball straight towards Henderson, Palace still lead by a goal, to nil. Yeah, I'm not sure it was directed for Salah, it might have been Diaz, but much better reactions when they lost the ball there. Nunez and Sabo say working really hard to get it back and recycle the ball and start again. And now you can hear it in the crowd, the crowd are feeling it as well. Better spell for Liverpool this, far better. Henderson clears it away, all in green away towards our right. Canate backpedalling, heads it forward, cushion header to Alexander Arnold from Saboslai, the England international, switches play out towards Robertson, midway through his own half, shy of the halfway line now, 11 minutes into the second half here on BBC Radio 5 Live. Not many people saw this with a title twist. They might have predicted when you look at Liverpool's run of fixtures coming up, Fulham away, Everton away, West Ham away, indeed they're not back at Anfield until the 5th of May against Tottenham Hotspur. But Crystal Palace to put a spanner in the works here as the clearance from Anderson, only as far as Robertson. Forward ball is behind Jones, another errant ball out for a Crystal Palace throw. Well, there's been too much of that today, hasn't there? Just misunderstandings between, you know, Purs. And again, you know, Curtis Jones has gone ahead of the ball before Anderson, uh, Robertson's even got under control. And as he's played it, he's on the moves. Just breaks up the momentum again. Sometimes you read a statistic and you think, you know, it's a little bit bizarre or quirky. Uh, Liverpool have, have scored more goals in the last 15 minutes of games this season than they have in the first half. That's incredible. 27 in the last 15 minutes. They've scored 25 in the first half this season. So in well, terms, this is set up for a senior, isn't it? It's set up for a. You take a grandstand finish anyway, but the. I always think you've got to get a, a goal in the first 15, 20 minutes of the second half just to give you that impetus for the last 20 minutes or so. Crystal Palace fans will not need reminding that they've conceded 22 goals in the last 15. If we're to get a grandstand finale here at Anfield in the sunshine, won't do much for the nerves of Liverpool as they still trail. Munoz chest the ball back, cleared by Klein, only as far as Curtis Jones, Wharton battling away in the midfield. Said he was being impeded, the referee says not. Liverpool now with McAllister, infield to Alexander-Arnold. Crystal Palace, to their credit, though, are still working so hard in the midfield. Hughes, Wharton, Elise and Eze. 
as the ball is rolled out towards that far side. How's it started at West Ham, Sahel Sahi? We've played an hour now here, Ian. It's still West Ham nil, Fulham 1. Much better from West Ham in this second half, but the best chance in this second 45 minutes has fallen to Fulham once again. It will be played through from midfield, inside the penalty, right-hand side, right-footed shot, top save from Fabianski, low down to his right-hand side. Still West Ham nil, Fulham 1. And commentary of that on Sports Extra. Van Dijk, forward ball out towards that far side, the left. Diaz now takes over, running forward on that left touchline, sends over the cross, blocked by Munoz, his fellow Colombian, behind for a corner kick in front of the cop, 1-0 Palace. There's definite momentum shift, shift in because Palace is starting to look a little bit sloppy in possession. And Liverpool have got the forward momentum, they, they're forcing the ball, they're forcing the game, exactly what you'd expect from Liverpool. Palace are just starting to wobble a little bit. Corner kick, far side the left, it's an out swinger, comes out towards Salah, bounced away off his left thigh and just enabled Crystal Palace to get the ball away. We're approaching the hour mark, Palace still have the lead. Alexander-Arnold volleys the ball in field, Canate with a little flick, Van Dijk tries to tee up Diaz, stumbles on the edge of the area, Crystal Palace still working manfully, it's a boss light, miss hits that and completely slices it high and into the cop and out for a goal kick and it's still Palace with the advantage. Again, wrong option. So he has a shot, Dominic Zabaze, but it's high, Wade and handsome and he should have just took a touch, ruled away to Robertson, kept the, kept the pressure on Palace. It just gives Palace a little bit of a breather because it's just, just come off it a little bit at the minute. The midfield's still working ever so hard, but the front three at the minute can't get back into the game the way they were in the first half. That uh, defeat against Atalanta on Thursday was Liverpool's first at home in 34 games since Real Madrid in the Champions League of February 2023. You have to go back to October 2022 for their last defeat at home in the Premier League against Leeds. Since then, undefeated in 28, but trailing by a goal to nil as Eze, the goal scorer, just pulls the ball away from Saboslai, tries to release Mateta. Runs in front of Canate, who's now back goal side, holds the ball up, tries to drop his shoulder, they've doubled up on Mateta, uses his strength to get away from McAllister. Canate, though, wrestles it away from Mateta. He's pinned back inside his own half, finds an outlet in his goalkeeper, Allison to clear it, headed back by Lerma. Hughes tried to direct his header towards Mitchell. Alexander-Arnold came under pressure from Morton. I mean, the work rate from the midfielders from Crystal Palace has been they have been great in there, haven't they? Great, Wharton and Hughes have picked up so many scraps and 50-50s have done a great job. Head down, Robertson runs forward, cross strikes the back of Diaz, presents Anderson with a header away. Hughes towards Wharton, Wharton lets it settle, back it goes to Clyde, forward towards Wharton again, takes it neatly into his stride. Elise, challenge, referee, has a good look at it, Mateta holds onto the ball under pressure, back it goes towards Hughes, Hughes slides into the challenge, loses out, referee gives a free kick in favour of Liverpool. Hughes is not happy about that, they've taken the free kick quickly. Out towards Luis Diaz, Liverpool still looking for an equaliser. Nunez can't run it forward, blocked to Bosley, to Salah, laid off. Alexander-Arnold hits it first time, right-footed on the rise, just outside the D into the cop. Still Palace lead by a goal to nil, they have a goal kick. Yeah, it's good from Liverpool, good pressure, but I did feel there was a foul on Hughes. But they worked it well from a quick free kick. Diaz stepping inside, goes all the way across to uh, Alexander-Arnold, gets the shot away. But again, no real conviction in it, Ian. It's a half chance, really. Just seemed to be a little bit rushed for the final bit of play, Liverpool. And that comes with the tension, obviously, chasing the game. Liverpool have it all to do. Time is ticking away. 62 minutes played. Palace still with the lead here on 5 Live. Commentary from 4.30 to come. Arsenal against Aston Villa. Champions League quarter-finals will give you a choice of listing on Wednesday. Manchester City, Real Madrid. On 5 Live, Bayern against Arsenal is on Sports Extra. And on Thursday, the Europa League quarter-final, we will be in Bergamo for Atalanta against Liverpool. And they've got it all to do to try and turn it around in that second leg after they were humbled here against the Italian side. Alexander-Arnold clears it away downfield. Nunez will give chase. Lerma lets it run out of play for a throw to Crystal Palace. Update in the Champions Cup in the Rugby Union, Adam Whitty. Toulouse 7, Exeter 13, the Chiefs lead, lead in the south of France, Ethan Roots barging down the door to dot down after a tap and go. Great start from the visitors, Toulouse 7, Exeter 13, 18 minutes gone. There is activity on the bench down below for Liverpool. They've got Elliot, they've got Jota, Gakpo as well. 
and see that Jot is going to be coming on and Gakpo as well. So we said about time running out, they're calling for reinforcements, Jurgen Klopp, because they can't afford to lose this game, can't afford to draw it. They've got to win it. Here is Alexander-Arnold. Swings over the cross from the right-hand side. Headed away well by Munoz. Picked up by Curtis Jones. Far side the left, in the sunshine here at Anfield. Van Dijk just outside the centre circle of the Crystal Palace half. The white shirts drop behind the ball. Jones midway through that Palace half. Back it goes to Van Dijk. Full-backs are pushed on. Canate gets the ball back from Saboslai. Then he goes out to his left for Van Dijk. Van Dijk waits, the Liverpool crowd try and play their part. Saboslai along the ground, Alexander-Arnold, early ball in field. Luis Diaz can't roll away from Anderson, too strong for him. Mitchell on this near side, the left, down the line it goes. Eze out of play, it'll be a Liverpool throw. And it will be Gakpo for Nunez and Jota coming on for Luis Diaz. The changes that will be made very, very soon by Jurgen Klopp. Those two substitutes are just getting the final instructions here at Anfield. We've been playing for 64 minutes. Liverpool still trail. There's a challenge from Munez on Jones. Free kick to Liverpool. And it's quickly taken as the ball is played out by Diaz. Out the far side, work it back. Then in central area for Alexander-Arnold. Van Dijk out to the left-hand side. Back with Van Dijk once again, substitutes are limbering up in front of us, Liverpool being patient, just trying to prise open this Palace defence. Salah can't find a way through at the minute, just playing in front of Palace. Yeah, but they've definitely got a clamp on the game now, you know, Palace look, you know, a little bit tired, Ez is not having any sort of effect on the game now, they've sort of uh, clamped down on that sort of area of the pitch that he was getting a lot of joy in in the first half, and now it's all possession for Liverpool at the minute, great ball. Ball towards Salah, running forward, right side of the area. Knocks the ball back with his head to Saboslai. Saboslai's cross charged down by Lerma. Forward ball to Eze. Lays it in field towards Hughes. First time ball for Mateta to give chase. Canate comes across. Out of play, it goes for a throw. These are the changes that will take place. Meanwhile, let's go to Manchester United Chelsea in the Women's FA Cup semi-final. Sani Rodovangela. Well, the holders have a foothold in this game. It's now Manchester United 2, Chelsea 1. Lauren James, the former red, side-footing inside the area, high into the roof of the net. Chelsea back in it as Manchester United 2, Chelsea 1. We are into the final moments of injury time. So Nunez comes off, Gakpo is on, Luis Diaz comes off, Diego Jota comes on. He came on the bench against Atalanta on Thursday night after missing the last 11 with a knee injury. And now you've got a front three of Salah, Gakpo and Jota. And as with 24 minutes remaining, plus added on time, Liverpool need realistically need to find two goals as they trail 1-0. Yeah, and they don't want to leave it too late. You don't, you don't want to equalise your 89th minute and sort of scramble for the winner. They're in control of the game. They're still not playing their brilliant football, but they've definitely got control of the game. They've been a lot better defensively, certainly in the second half. It's just about getting that breakthrough now. Ian. Ball for Saboslai. Comes back towards it. Mitchell, Gakpo, quickly involved. Links up with Salah. Gakpo with a cutback. Jones couldn't take it in his stride, much to the agony of the, uh, the cock. Robertson with a cross, blocked by Klein on that far side. All he needed to do was just get a touch, did Jones, with a goal in front of him gaping. Liverpool now knocking at the door. Gakpo now on that left-hand side. We're almost midway through the second half. Crystal Palace defending stoutly, still leading by a goal to nil. No. Ball played forward straight through to Henderson, gathers it in safely. Massive chance in. Brilliant play from... Uh... <clears throat> Salah and Gakpo and a brilliant pullback from Gakpo. How Curtis Jones doesn't get contact on it, I just don't know. They're looking at a handball here as well, but not too sure that the, his arm's out, really. Andy Robertson was adamant it was a penalty. We're looking at it again. Uh, I think it'd be difficult to give that. Jordan Ayew is going to be coming on. Elise is the player who's going to be coming off. Uh, he had that last 16 minutes against Manchester City, but they'll have to just manage him and nurture him and get him, ease him back in, will Michael Luce after that thigh injury. So, Jordan, are you to come on? Half-time, Manchester United 2, Chelsea 1 in that second Women's FA Cup semi-final with the right to play Tottenham in the final. So, are you is on for Elise? 
And we're midway through the second half, so a quarter of the game remains, and Liverpool still trail by a goal to nil. Here is Jota, far side, Gakpo on the left-hand side, coming in field now. Finds Alexander-Arnold inside the centre circle, forward ball. Jota's made the run, Anderson has been immense at the back for, uh, for Crystal Palace with the header away, only as far as Alexander-Arnold, short diagonal ball to Saboslai, now out towards Salah, early ball in, Saboslai plays it across and Anderson with the outstretched clearance in front of his own goal, directs it up and over the bar and into the top for a corner kick. Oh, what outstanding football, great one-two between Salah and Zabaze and then a brilliant cross and just outstanding defending, world-class defending from Anderson. How he got to that and kept it out of the net is beyond me. Much, much better from Liverpool. They've been really good second half. You feel as if a goal is coming. So Bosley with the corner. It's an outswinger. Van Dijk with the header was off target and desperately trying to get on the end of it was Jota with a lunge at the far post and it went probably a yard in front of him and out it goes for a goal kick. And Henderson is testing the patience of the cop and the Liverpool supporters as he bides his time with the goal kick. Just over 20 minutes remain. Liverpool nil, Crystal Palace one. Really good last 15 minutes in from Liverpool. Much, much better, much more like them. All right, they've been sloppy a little bit in possession, but they're really trying to force us. You can't fault their attitude. It's just that, just that killer touch now they need just to top it off. And then if it gets the 1-1, you know it's going to be the Alamo for the, the remainder of the game. Despite going back to the top of the table last night, Manchester City's destiny before today was still out of their own hands. The advantage still was with Arsenal and Liverpool if they were to win their remaining games. Liverpool would lose that right. We'll have commentary of Arsenal Aston Villa from 4.30. But Liverpool are still pushing as they trail. Gakpo on the left-hand side with the cross. Headed out by Lerma under pressure. Helped further away by Wharton. Headed back by Canate. Stabbed forward by Munoz. Yayu loses the ball, Gakpo, there's an intensity about Liverpool now, Jones with the cross, Jota couldn't get there, Mitchell tucked in, prevents it from reaching Salah, and Crystal Palace can break, and Ayu was tripped by Jones, he's going to get a yellow card, that'll be a free kick. We mentioned that game at the Emirates, team news from Chris Wise. All changes from the draw with Bayern Munich, Zinchenko, Trossard and Jesus in for Kivior, Jorginho and Martinelli. Villa have made two alterations from Thursday, Bailey goes to the bench, Douglas Luiz is suspended, Diaby and Zaniolo come in. Danny Gabadon joining Chris Wise for commentary at half four. And there's been a goal at West Ham, Sahel Sahi. A second for Fulham, a second for Andres Pereira on the counter-attack. It's West Ham nil, Fulham two, a raid down the right-hand side. Low ball into the penalty area, and he wasn't going to miss from seven yards away. West Ham nil, Fulham two. And after 6.06 and that Arsenal-Aston Villa game, a reminder that the US Masters final round from 8 o'clock with Mark Chapman and the team will be live here on 5 Live. Anderson with that free kick, eventually taken, drilled downfield. Alexander-Arnold's header will go back towards Alisson. And there are 18 minutes remain, and Liverpool still trail by a goal to nil. Yeah, 18-plus add-ons. Yes. So we're looking at a good 20 minutes, plenty of time. But, it, you know, I'm just looking at the body language of the Palace players. Plain went down... Lerma's been holding his hip. He's just starting to look a little bit fatigued, which we felt because it put so much into the first half. You know, Liverpool couldn't play as badly as that again, and to be fair, they are playing very, very well at the minute. It's a boss light infield to Jones. It might still reach the boss light, pulls it back. Trotter, what a block that was! That was Nathaniel Klein. That looked a goal for all the world. And then Nathaniel Klein, not quite on the goal line, but inside his six yard box, gets the block in. Well, suppose they get the other side of Anderson, rolls it back, it's a dolly for Jota, he should just roll it in the corner. It's brilliant from Klein to get his body there, but that's an absolute sitter. Corner kick for Liverpool, still trailing 1-0, it's an outswinger from the far side, Van Dijk is up and his header drops and is caught by Henderson, who holds onto it all in green inside his penalty area. 17 minutes remain. <laughs> That's two unbelievable chances. You think of the Nunez one in front of the goal, and now the Jato one, and the Liverpool fans were thinking, and Jurgen Klopp, is this going to be our day? Henderson, at some point, I would imagine, is going to get a yellow card for time wasting. He's starting to test the patience of the Liverpool crowd. They'll be putting pressure on referee Chris Kavner. Meanwhile, Chris Kavner awards a free kick in favour of Crystal Palace. 
haven't been as much as an attacking force in this second no, half. No, they haven't. You've got to give Liverpool credit for that. They've tidied up the issues that they had to deal with in the first half. Eze has been very quiet. Obviously, Elise has gone off the pitch. Ayu's on, really, to get Palace up the pitch now. It's basically we have what we hold. But they're hanging on at the minute because Liverpool are really, you know, coming on strong. And to be fair, they've created some great chances in. Well, they've got this free kick. It is left of centre. Midway through the Liverpool half, they're attacking the Anfield road end, playing from right to left as we look. As of the goal scorer, right footed curls, it hangs in the air, and Mateta is there! Oh my and goodness! What? Oh my Was that a save from Alisson? Yeah. Oh He's hit it at point blank range, it's rolled up the goalkeeper, Mateta can't believe it. I've never seen anything like that. And it's all the world, the goalies. He puts out a big army and saves it. It's incredible! Absolutely incredible! It's kept Liverpool in the title race. What a strong arm that was from Alisson. Mateta from close range. So Alisson and Robertson in the first half have stopped Palace leading and taking a two-goal lead in this game. Eze with the corner kick, far side the left. Mitchell, far side, hammered away then by Alexander-Arnold. If all of a sudden Palace had gone 2 0 but now all of a sudden it's Jones has released. Jones inside the penalty area. Jones has put it wide. What a chance that was for Liverpool, and it has been squandered. This game is bonkers. It's absolute. I've never seen misses like this in my life. What a counter-attack. Brilliant from Gakpo. Releases Jones. He's clean through, one-on-one. -on -one, gets across the defender, steadies himself, and puts it wide. It's an incredible miss. And the, the Mateta miss was even worse. Two yards out, blasts it. And Allison makes the save of a, a lifetime. I, that will be reeled over and over again for years to come. What an arm that was. Well, all of a sudden, it's a huge let off at one end for Liverpool because you couldn't see them scoring three goals in 15 minutes, which is what they would have required. And then at the other, a chance to level. And Jones really should have made it 1 1. Oh, he should, yeah. I mean, that's three clear cut chances Liverpool have had. But none as clear cut as a Mateta one. I mean, this game could be 3 3, you know. Um, the lack of finishing, brilliant goalkeeping, it's had a bit of everything. And the whole thing surrounding it all, Ian, is the tension around the stadium and the significance of what lays ahead of us in the next 15 minutes. There's going to be a triple change for Crystal Palace. Riedebelt is going to be coming on. Joel Ward is a, another player. And also Jeffrey Schluck is uh, another one for uh, for Crystal Palace and fresh legs as Oliver Glasner looks to get these three points here at Anfield. Nathaniel Klein will go off, that will be Ward who will replace him on the right side of that three-man defence. Nathaniel Klein, a former Liverpool player, taking his time. Hughes is the player who's going to be coming off for Riedeveldt. He's worked ever so hard, he turns 29 on Wednesday, it's his birthday. So Riedeveldt, who's missed the last six games, will come on for, uh, for Will Hughes. And the other change will be Jeffrey Schlupp for the goal scorer. Everiche Eze. So Crystal Palace going into defensive mode, where we're at that time, inside the last 15 minutes, where Liverpool have scored the most goals in the Premier League, Crystal Palace have conceded the most, and the fourth official, amidst all of that, is struggling to work the electronic board, which isn't helping matters. Yeah, and Liverpool players are getting after Chris Kavanagh, telling them to get a move on. It's just, you know, the dark arts, if you want to call it that, from Crystal Palace. They're slowing the game down. They're trying to break the momentum up that Liverpool have had. But uh, this game is just, you know, I haven't seen a game like this for a long time in terms of, you know, quality chances being missed and just the excitement and the tension around the stadium at the minute and what it means to particularly Liverpool at the minute. With your experience of winning a title, if Liverpool don't win this game... I think they're out of it. They're out of the championship. Yeah, I think so, yeah. And to be honest with you, they don't look like a championship-winning team today. You know, even the Mateta chance, Ian, it was a free kick, it was a free header for Anderson to head it down, and Mateta's two yards out with a free hit. You know, you can't afford to do that. And there's another turnover. Salah gave the ball away, tries to win it back, slips. There is a desperation now inside Anfield amongst the growing frustration, anxiety amongst the supporters, which you can certainly feel. 
here at Anfield. Canate, they're scrambling Liverpool, and time is running out. 12 minutes of normal time remain. Curtis Jones out towards Robertson. Robertson running forward over the halfway line. Palace still lead by a goal to nil. Gakpo, six yards inside the Palace half. Canate out then towards Alexander-Arnold. Remember, you have to go back the three years since the last time that Liverpool in back-to-back -back games failed to score here at Anfield. Gakpo on the far side, the left, delivers the cross, headed out by Anderson, been absolutely outstanding at the back for Palace. Van Dijk forward, Canate plays it, lifts it over the top, it's a heavy touch, Jota can't keep it in play. Goal kick to Crystal Palace, and 11 minutes remain. And Jurgen Klopp, deep in thought in that technical area. Well, I think the referee has to have a word with Henderson as well. You know, he's really sort of milking it now. You know, the, the time waste, and he's going from one side of the box to the other, which is his right to do, obviously. But it's been going on, you know, for the last 20 minutes now or so, and you can feel the frustration, not just from the, the fans, but the players as well. But it's been exhilarating to watch this game. Can't take your eyes off it, Ian. And it's certainly full of drama for what's at stake. There is a real jeopardy as Liverpool Jones couldn't take it forward into his path, desperately trying to win the ball back. They do so. Turnover in the midfield, Jones. Crystal Palace, though, are fighting for everything. Ryderbelt just snapped his way into the challenge. You might remember that 3-3 game at Selhurst Park. It was ten years ago next month when Crystal Palace produced three goals in the last 12 minutes to draw 3-3 at Selhurst Park to dash Liverpool's title hopes that year. We've got 12 minutes remaining. Liverpool need two. There's Van Dijk to McAllister. McAllister 25 yards out. Not much of an atmosphere inside Anfield. There is a sense of growing frustration from this crowd as Mateta comes forward, plays it out towards Schluck, couldn't take it, bypassed him. Forced out wide on this left-hand side. Mitchell in field. Wharton been, had a terrific game in the midfield. Schlupp, that was a weak cross. Allison will claim it. No, he won't. Van Dijk will get there before him. Downfield to Salah. Hooks it downfield. Alexander-Arnold might have been offside. Instead, he hits a diagonal ball that was too hurried. Straight through towards Henderson. There's a lack of composure about yeah, Liverpool's play. I thought he picked the wrong ball again. It was just a little round the corner ball to Jota. And Jota was in at a 2v1. He's just trying to lash one across the gap. It was such a high tariff to do, and the simple ball was Jota. So again, there's just that anxiety around the players as well. They've needed the goalie, and I'm not where he is. They might get a goal, but it might be too late to win the game. Harvey Elliott is going to be coming on for Liverpool. When the two sides met at Selhurst Park, it was Harvey Elliott who got a 91st-minute winner. Liverpool need an equaliser first before they can have any notions of a winner here as they're toiling Sir light out towards Van Dijk Robertson now it's with Curtis Jones final instructions given to Harvey Elliott back it goes to Van Dijk Alexander-Arnold takes over in the centre circle Hits the ball forward, Salah trying to get round the back, Mitchell's header goes in towards the penalty area, Anderson again is there to volley the ball away. He hasn't missed a trick and his header goes behind for a corner kick. Eight minutes remain, Palace still holding on. And it's going to be Curtis Jones who's going to be coming off for Harvey Elliott. If Liverpool, who've got a habit of scoring late, they're going to leave it very, very late. As they still trail to that Eber Ichi as a goal in the 14th minute here. So Bosley hands on hips, waits in front of the cop. Crystal Palace looking for their first win since early November. Out swinging corner, Van Dyke climbs, gets something on it. Henderson can't get there. Van Dyke tries to stab it forward. Mateta hammers the ball away inside the six yard area, and referee Chris Kavner has noticed a foul, free kick to Crystal Palace, high fives from Lerma and Henderson. Palace I I still defending. I don't know what the foul was for, though, but Henderson's gone fishing and he's he's getting nowhere. The ball bounces off Van Dijk's head really high and Henderson comes to punch it, can't get there. 
I don't see what the foul is for. It's just a 50-50 in the box, but again, very frustrating for Liverpool. Great for Palace. They can just slow things down, get a breather, take the sting out of things. And the body language, you know, they're going to keep going, Liverpool. How long's left, Ian? What do you make it? Seven minutes remaining Seven minutes normal plus. time. There will be... At least five? I'd say so, yeah. Liverpool have used up all their subs, and what? Palace have used up three or four, so you'd imagine with him slowing the game down, Henderson as well, the ref's going out on a bit of time, so what you're looking at, maybe 12 minutes to win it. First time in top division history that three teams have had 70 points after 31 games. The title race could be going from three to two with Liverpool losing. Jota's diagonal forward ball, Salah, Lerma holds him off, Lerma tumbles, gets a foot into the challenge to force Salah away from goal, holds off Mitchell, Salah does well, plays the ball back, McAllister keeps it with Liverpool, midway through the Palace half though now, towards Robertson, six minutes remain of normal time here on Five Live and Five Live Sport, Munoz with a tackle on Saboslai, free kick to Liverpool, about eight yards in from the left touchline. Lerma did brilliantly again, the foot race for Salah, you know, he's, he's running on fumes at the minute, Lerma, but he stayed with him, dogged to the end and you've got to give Palace an enormous amount of credit they've defended heroically at times when they've needed to and they've done it with one recognised centre half so far can't fault them Anderson Lerma have been uh, outstanding in defence Robertson with this free kick on that far side the left attacking the cop Robertson left footed Comes in, Munoz heads the ball away. Elliot has a little glance over his shoulder, right-hand side of the penalty area. Ball swung in by Alexander-Arnold. Lerma there again to head it away, repelled by the Colombian. You sense as well, judging by the atmosphere, that there is a feeling of resignation from the Liverpool supporters here with just over five minutes remaining. A goal might change all of that. Are oh, you couldn't release Mateta. To boss lie, that was risky. Tried a, a back pass, almost cut out by an outstretched leg of Mateta. Allison now plays it forward. Five minutes remain of normal time. Crystal Palace still lead Liverpool by a goal to nil. What a boost this will be ahead of our next commentary for Arsenal against Aston Villa at 4:30. As Crystal Palace now with Mateta, 10 yards inside the Liverpool half, he falls to the ground far too easily. Gakpo gets away from the outstretched leg of Wharton, comes on the inside, now hits a diagonal ball, Elliot looks to control it, plays the ball in, takes a deflection into the penalty area, Ward with a clearance. No chances there from Joel Ward. Liverpool won a quick throw, but there's two balls on the pitch, Neil Lennon. Yeah, the fans are wanting Jada to get a cross, Ward and attack that ball. Uh, Elliot did well, dug out a great cross, but... Jota just didn't go and attack it and awarded an easy clearance. Mateta, who's led that line very, very well, so often on his own, is going to be coming off. Edouard is going to be coming on for Crystal Palace. Haven't had the best of records against Liverpool of late, but Gakpo round the back, checks back into the penalty area with a cross towards the far post. Elliot saved by the leg, the hands of Henderson. Liverpool still pressing, Alexander-Arnold on the half volley, into the penalty area, cross comes in, Jota climbs, Anderson off his chest, has the composure to then clear it away right-footed. Four minutes remain, Palace still lead by a goal to nil. What a win this would be for Crystal Palace. Brilliant in the first half, resilient in the second. Elliot now towards Van Dijk, Van Dijk in the centre circle. Sabos line midway through the Crystal Palace half. Now with McAllister. Van Dijk to Canate, Oliver Glasner hopping, feeling every pass at the moment, trying that his side will still keep them at bay. Passing the ball in short triangles, Liverpool at the moment, without really going anywhere. Three minutes remain of normal time. Ideally, they need two goals. In this title race, as Elliot on the right-hand side, passes the ball back into the centre circle. The captain, Van Dijk, facing only his second defeat in the Premier League at home. In 98 games, Canate, central position, Van Dijk gets it again. So Bosley provides the width on the far side, Robertson is on the edge of the area. Liverpool still playing in front of Crystal Palace, two and a half minutes remain. Alexander-Arnold forward, crosses on the run, tucked in was Ward to head the ball away. Headed by McAllister back towards Van Dijk, Glasner applauds the effort of his Crystal Palace players. Elliot now, Liverpool still looking. Van Dijk, now towards McAllister, rolled out towards Saboslai, 10 yards in from the left touch line, just on the edge of the shadows of the cop, crosses the ball, Alexander-Arnold off his chest, hammers it into the penalty area, blocked by Lerma, Mitchell couldn't get there, Lerma then again to clear the ball away, Palace will push out, 
Alisson's actually inside the Palace half. Yeah, it's just one way traffic as you'd expect now. Can they get the breakthrough here? Alex can Palace hold on? I mean, it's been a riveting watch. You know, Palace don't deserve to lose it, but Liverpool don't lose or yeah, lose the lead, but Liverpool don't deserve to lose the game for me because they've created enough chances to get something out of it. Here is Van Dijk, quickly helps it on its way. Gakpo runs in off the left touch line, cross blocked by Munoz. Behind for another corner kick. Under two minutes of normal time remain live on BBC Radio 5 Live and BBC Sounds. Liverpool nil, Crystal Palace one. Liverpool, remember, start of the day third. They would finish it in third, but the game in hand would they had not taken advantage, would remain two points behind City. In comes the corner kick, Anderson again attacks it, heads it away, Sabosli on the stretch, out towards McAllister, feeding it out towards the left, down it goes towards our Elliott, can't keep in play. Liverpool, for all their pressure, don't look like scoring. But they have done. You know, what we have to remember is, you think of the Nunes chance, you think of the Jota chance, they're clear cut, the, the Curtis Jones one on one, they're clear cut chances, they haven't taken them. So there is this sort of uh, misnomer that, you know, they don't, they're not going to score, but they have had the chances, that's the point that a coach would make. However, you've you got to take them, you know, and they haven't done that, and they've forced the game second half, and they've, they've really had a good goal, but you've got to give. Palace, huge amount of credit. They were a brilliant first half on the counter attack, and they've defended like heroes in the second, in the second half. And it just shows you, and when it comes to, there's no easy games in this Premier League. No, no, a Crystal Palace side uh, who winless actually in the last five games since Glasgow won his opening game against Burnley. Edward has come on for Mateta as the ball back from Robertson, taken high on the chest by Allison, and we are now about to find out how much stoppage time there will be, because by my watch, the 90 minutes of normal time are all but up. And Liverpool still trail by a goal to nil. The next instalment of the title race will be at the Emirates, Arsenal, Aston Villa at 4.30. Seven minutes of added on time, which we're now into. Seven minutes of stoppage time here at Anfield. It offers, albeit late, but renewed hope for the optimistic Liverpool supporters inside Anfield. Elliot, Alexander-Arnold combines with Elliot on the right-hand side. Elliot with the cross, redeveloped with the header away. Alexander-Arnold to McAllister, goes square. Sabosli passes the ball to Gakpo, left corner of the area. Gakpo delivers the cross in, off the chest of Jota. Salah is there! And oh, what a run that was by Mitchell! It tracks him every way! And the left wing back pops up on the far side to run another goal bound effort wide. It's incredible, he's two yards out, he, it looks all the world a goal, and Mitchell comes from nowhere and blocks it. Unbelievable. Cross comes in from the corner kick. Heroic defending by Crystal Palace this afternoon. You think that they've prevented three certain goals. Mitchell, the one from Klein, earlier on as well. And then the Henderson one from the legs of, uh, of Nunez. We welcome listeners to the BBC World Service. Here we are at Anfield in the closing stages. We're in the first minute, or in fact just entered the second minute, of the minimum of seven here at Anfield, where Crystal Palace are still leading Liverpool by a goal to nil. A goal from Eberichi Eze in the 14th minute of the game. And Liverpool's title challenge is seriously faltering. Elliot. Back it goes. Liverpool camped inside the Palace half, but Palace have defended manfully throughout this second half. Van Dijk waits, passes the ball towards Alexander-Arnold, rolls it out towards Elliot. Elliot swings over the cross, blacked by Ayew, cleared then by Wharton. Ayew now has to go it alone, the Ghanaian, runs forward, short of the halfway line, has no options, passes the ball back to Riedevelt. Van Dijk steps forward, prevents it from reaching Schlupp, forward ball, here is Mo Salah, Salah waits for the ball to settle, goes down inside the penalty area, Jota forced out wide, left-hand side, they've doubled up on Jota, and Munoz will be there for Crystal Palace. And they get a throw, Liverpool, down by the corner flag over on that far side, and five minutes remain. Still they trail. From the throw, Sabosli, Kunate, 30 yards out from goal. Salah, Mitchell, tracking him every step of the way, tight as ever. Edouard tries to put pressure on McAllister. He got a knock in the back, McAllister's gone down, winded in the kidney area there as Van Dijk passes the ball out towards Gakpo. Gakpo on the left, enters 
the edge of the penalty here on that left-hand side, delivers the cross, Salah's touch goes away from him, out of the box, Alexander-Arnold plays a flat ball in, Lerma, terrific defending again, Ian Anderson haven't missed a trick, so impressive. Yeah, he's been great, you know, considering he's a centre midfield player, he's read the game brilliantly, he's always been there, so is his big partner Anderson, and they've been a wall today, even though they have been breached a few times, the goal is still intact at the minute, Ian. Here is Elliot. Four minutes now remain. Palace still lead by a goal to nil. Title slipping away, or the title hope slipping away here in Anfield for Liverpool. Elliot now, edge of the area. Elliot onto his left foot, delivers the cross over the head of everybody. Did it take a deflection? Liverpool players thought so. Referee Chris Kavner says not. Goal kick, Liverpool nil. Palace won, 93 and a half minutes played. Lerma's gone down. I'm not surprised if he's got cramped. Yeah. <laughs> he's been everywhere today. He's given so much to his team. I know the fans are a little bit frustrated, but an injury's an injury, you know. And uh, he's been a... Uh, he's been a stalwart today, I think he's been brilliant for Palace, as is young Wharton in midfield, I think he's had a great game as well in this environment against the quality of opposition, I think he stood out for me as well. Judging by the bottom tier of that Sir Kenny Dalglish stand, the amount of Liverpool supporters heading for the exits, they don't believe, they don't have faith that their Liverpool side will score in the next three minutes that remain of injury time as Palace, who've only kept two clean sheets in their last 23 are going to get a clean sheet here today, and you would think five points clear of the relegation zone before today, never seriously felt that they'd get relegated anyway, but that would be enough for Crystal Palace this season as they look forward to a 12th successive season in the top flight, their longest ever run in the top division of English football. And two and a half minutes remain, and Liverpool still trail by a goal to nil. They've got it all to do in, in Europe in midweek. We'll have that commentary for you on Thursday. This could be a serious setback for their title, though. Salah, back it goes. McAllister finds Elliott, cross-charge down. Mitchell, to a man. Crystal Palace players have been absolutely brilliant in yeah, every well, I aspect. I have to say, you know, Munoz, Mitchell, Lerma, Anderson, playing when he was on, the back five have been outstanding. Uh, I thought Hughes and uh, Wharton in the first half were brilliant and, you know, we talked about Eze and Elise and what they bring to the team. You know, they're just a different team when those two, two play together. Um, and they were brilliant first half. They've had to be resolute second half. They've hung in there, they've rode their luck a little bit. But they, it looks like they're going to come away with an unbelievable result here, Ian. Certainly does. They haven't beaten Liverpool in their last 13 meetings since Sam Allardyce and two goals from Christian Benteke seven years ago. After that, Liverpool went on a long and beaten run of 68 games here at, uh, at Anfield, but their undefeated run in the Premier League of 28 is going to be coming to an end. The Crystal Palace fans in that half of the Anfield road end towards the left, as we look, are starting to celebrate. They know that they're going to get a valuable three points here under Oliver Glasner as Mitchell, with 60 seconds remaining, keeps the ball down in the corner flag. And Liverpool with back-to-back -back defeats as Ayu tries to win a corner. Now you can forget any idea of Liverpool winning this game. The question is, can they salvage a point, even though that, that probably won't be enough? As the ball is played back to Alisson. Jurgen Klopp is having a word with the assistant referee. Chris Kavner has... I think there's a little off the ball incident between Lerma and Salah. Lerma's been shown a yellow card as a result, and a free kick has been awarded to Liverpool. Lerma's shown a yellow card for that off the ball incident. So the ball will be brought up away over the halfway line, free kick, well, it's sort of the second third of the pitch. This Alex, is it. it is. This is it. It's a Hail Mary now for Liverpool. Can Palace see it out? Whether it's enough. Allison is coming up from the back. I remember being at the Hawthorns when he scored a goal for, for Liverpool. But the seven minutes have added on time are all but over. In goes the free kick. Van Dijk gets his header on that. And eventually it's dealt with. So Bosley runs the ball out of play for a, a goal kick. And once again, the high fives from Anderson and Henderson at the back. And Crystal Palace have won. Liverpool have been beaten and their long unbeaten run in the Premier League at home of 28 games comes to a shuddering halt and maybe so does their title aspirations it's a serious setback Crystal Palace outstanding in every aspect 
attacking and adventurous in the first half, resilient and stubborn in the second, and Liverpool have lost back-to-back -back games here at Anfield. Europe on Thursday, the Premier League today, and Crystal Palace held on. Liverpool nil, Crystal Palace one, Neil Lennon. Well, what a game. That game gave us everything, both teams give us everything. Uh, incredible result for Crystal Palace, congratulations to them. They're First half performance was absolutely brilliant. Liverpool really tried to force the game second half and to be fair, created four clear-cut, and I mean clear-cut chances to get them back into the game. But it wasn't to be. And it's a huge blow. It may be irreparable, Ian, in terms of their title charge. You can't lose games at home at this stage of the season. And uh, what a horrible week it's been for Liverpool to draw in a defeat on Thursday and a defeat again today. They left everything out on the pitch. They just couldn't score, but they should have done with the opportunities that they had. But let's give an enormous amount of credit to Oliver.